It's time for Screen Junkies Movie Fights. <laughs> hoot hoot, Owl Nation. Where are my birds at? What's up, guys? Welcome to Movie Fights. I am not a member of Owl Nation. That's why you know that that was a terrible, terrible Owl Nation attempt. I'm Joe Starr. Hal Rudnick is stuck in traffic. He'll be here in like 15, 20 minutes. Welcome back to Movie Fights. We got a huge... All summer, all hit, all home runs, no filler, all killer lineup. Look at this panel of fighters. Holy crap, it's Mark Ellis! Good Fresh to be with you, store. Hal. Oh, this is gonna be a fun <laughs> show. I am very excited about this for a number of reasons. Hal, Spencer, mm -hmm. the other guy. But here's why I'm most <laughs> pumped about this. I think I might have the hottest take in the history of movie fights in one of these categories. I saw, Ooh, I maybe saw. Maybe a steamy hot take. I'm spicy. ready for this. Yeah, no, <laughs> if, if you stay tuned for nothing else besides me, Hal Rudnick, Tune in for this take, because it is very, very hot. Uh, before we meet these other two jabronis, because people know them, let me read the plug that you yourself wrote Offer. on my page in your beautiful hand. Mark Thank Ellis, you. big show at the Comedy Store on Sunset, September 12th, this Thursday. Oh, wow, tell me Lots of it. big names, Ooh. like me, Hal Rudnick. Oh. No, no, that's I've not true. Sure. Yeah. 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 Now, still if, pushing if the bit. was booked on the show, he is not on the show as <laughs> the, the taping of this show. But we Guys, do have a lot of big names. You can grab tickets at markellis.com. Uh, Mark Ellis Live. MarkEllisLive.com. Mark Ellis Live. Mark Ellis yeah. I apologize. I almost said .org. Uh, every <laughs> one of these Mark Ellis and Friends shows you put on are fantastic. You, uh, Top notch. You joined us at, uh, at Comic San Diego Con. Comic Con. That was a lot of fun. You I was the low point, but even at that point, it was still a very good show. That's what kind of value we're talking you about. You had the mustache, you didn't have the rest of the facial hair, so No, yeah, I was still figuring things out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But it was really exciting. So yeah, a lot of big uh, drop-ins. It's a comedy yeah. store on Sunset. You never knew it was going to show up. And uh, I'm on the show with Ken Knapsack, a great drunk movie fighter. Mm -hmm. He's going to be mm -hmm. on the show. Mm -hmm. Candace Thompson from mm -hmm. The Tonight Show. Mm -hmm. Matt Nost, very funny. And then, you know, some special surprises. So. It's going to be a good show. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of special fun. surprises, let's meet these other two fighters. Mm. What a surprise. I'm amazed we got you guys <laughs> booked. Spencer J. Gilbert. Dan Merle, Hello. welcome to the show. Hi, thank you, Hal. Yeah, Hal, welcome. I don't care what they're saying about you online, about your comments, about the Jews and the Muslims. <laughs> You're never canceled in my book. Hey, thanks, guys. <laughs> Just happy to be here and not canceled. And congrats on the wedding, by the way. Oh, no, I, yeah. thank you very yeah. much. Uh, we're very happy, fantastic honeymoon, and uh, just really excited to set up our lives together. Yeah, I follow you on Instagram. The filter that you use, a little different just being right here next mm -hmm. to the man. But, Still um, working on the filters. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, it's either Gingham or Nashville that best brings out oh, the mustache. Yeah, yeah, Speaking good. of Gingham and Nashville, it's over on the couch. It's Lon Danielle <laughs> calling. It's Lon Harris and Danielle Radford and whoever just ran by the camera frame. <laughs> We do the show monthly now, that means we forget how to do it. professional operation we got going. Checking the facts, Lon Harris. How's it going? That was Hal that just ran by. He doesn't want to be on the show anymore. He has officially quit. He's done. And typically she's the voice of the people, but we have not given the people a voice this episode. So she's just our beautiful judge number three, Daniel Radford. You'll always have a voice with me, people. That is a cut song from the new Aladdin movie. <laughs> you know what my favorite thing about the new thing with movie fights since we've gone monthly is mm -hmm. that having more time to plan and pre-tape really takes the chaos out of doing it. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Like, that's really the reason yeah. we did it was to make the show easier easier to produce and execute mm -hmm. it. And I'm glad we've gotten off to such an orderly uh, mm -hmm. start here. We had a month to set this up, yeah. and I feel so prepared, I feel refreshed. Yeah. The email yeah. I got not 11 minutes ago to be here yeah. at the studio, yeah. I was able to print myself and do my cryotherapy, all of the main thing yeah. I usually do to prepare for an argument against two of the greatest in the business. I feel uh, very ready. Yeah, we're a well-oiled machine here, but uh, it's like the end of Snowpiercer, where the machine is actually small children. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> operating that well-oiled machine. <laughs> I, you it know what? I see one of them now. It song. definitely feels like we planned a surprise birthday party and then forgot we were going to do the surprise birthday <laughs> yeah. party. Yeah. And then the, the guest didn't show up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Surprise. But guys, uh, that's classic we can make movie it to, fights. Could we get to minute 20 without starting the show? <laughs> yeah, no, that's... <laughs> it's me, Hal Rudnick. What do you think was going to happen? <laughs> guys, but that's classic movie fights feelings and that means we're going back to classic movie fights rules. Not only are you three fighters that aren't standing like a bunch of morons, we're going back to <laughs> five main round Woo. questions and up to five speed round questions. Woo. You guys wanted the show to be really long again. We're giving you a show that's really long again. You demanded sitting. You yeah. demanded length. <laughs> and We're you got you. all of that. 
Hey, settle in. Enough, uh, enough of my time wasting, hoping that Hal will show up to actually host. <laughs> this is let's been fight. One of the let's best fight. filibusters I've ever seen. <laughs> 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 Thank All right, you. let's do it again. Let's fight. No, Play that package no, one more no, time, JT. So Start good. to wrap it. Start the show, for God's sakes, please. <laughs> Something I've wanted to say my entire Screen Junkies career. Thank you, Thor. Mm. Thank you, Thor. Question number one, let's do it. Ring that bell. I don't know if we still have the sound effect bell or if we actually have <laughs> to use say, the real one now. I was going to say, that means somebody's at the front desk waiting to check in. <laughs> question number Tell. one, very small question, gentlemen. What's the best movie of summer 2019? Ooh. Ooh. We, had, we were counting summer beginning in May? Yes. yes. Just to clarify? No Hot Avengers Girl Summer it. officially began in May to Labor Day. Right. Summer that is, is when the pool, when the community pool opens for the very first time. Yep. Mm -hmm. That is when May, summer begins. Yeah, May, whatever that May, is. Mm -hmm. First weekend of May. Yeah, we're currently in Halloween season, looking back at summer. So, Mark Ellis, I ask you, What's the best movie of summer 2019? It's a good question, Hal. I mean, look, because Avengers Endgame, uh, try as they might Marvel and Disney, they try to alter time with their stones, but they can't do mm. it and place Avengers Endgame mm. into the summer. So we have to pick something else. Don't worry, faithful viewer, the home watcher. I figured out the best movie of the summer. It's got comedy, it's got action, it's got bananas all over the place, and it's a really <laughs> funny, heartwarming story. Good Boys is the best movie of the summer. It is hilarious. It was unexpected. Aren't the best movies the ones that you didn't know were coming out? Then you see some crazy trail and you go, oh my God, I got to go see this. And I like the producers, Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. And then those three kids look like they have some potty mouths. And it's not just bad humor and, and, and bad kids saying bad words for the sake of shock value. It really has a lot of nice emotional content through there. I think it helps kids adapt to whatever they're going through. School is back in session. Good Boys is one of the reasons why I am happy to say I lived through sixth grade. I had all of those uh, things go on in my own life. I think everybody did. It's a very relatable movie, and for that reason, it's the best of the summer. You want to feel good when you go to the movie theater. That's what Good Boys does. Good Boys makes you feel good. That was a weird sentence to say out loud. Spencer, mm, yeah. what was the best <laughs> movie of summer 2019? Uh, I think that it's a pretty, that. <laughs> <laughs> pretty gross, Hal. Uh, pretty easy choice. Uh, I think far and away, the best movie of the summer is J-Dub Trey, John Wick 3, Parabellum. <laughs> it is so good. This is a movie that cemented John Wick as the best action franchi uh, franchise of, uh, I'd say, the millennium. Um, it is everything you want out of a John Wick movie, and it keeps managing to up the ante. This is a movie where John Wick murders a uh, giant with a library book, and then there's 120 minutes left. <laughs> um, he kills people with two horses. They just find the most creative ways to, without resorting to CG, without resorting to contrived melodrama, all the other tricks that uh, franchises fall into. They manage to keep it fresh, but keep it essentially wick and keep us coming back for more. Well said. Champ? I'm going with a movie that came out from one of the most interesting directors working today, uh, Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I think was the best movie of the summer. It was pure cinema. It was, I love when a movie comes out that it's not just a movie, it, it's, it's a cinematic experience, and that's what Quentin Tarantino put together. It is a movie about movies, which I think is a fun thing to do in the summer. It's not a Western, it's not something like that. It's about Hollywood, it's about big blockbuster movie making, uh, and it's a fantasy. I, I don't wanna go too far into spoilers uh, for the movie, but I love the fact that a lot of people were kind of worried about how is this gonna be tinged by these real life events that were very horrific that happened and Quentin Tarantino found a way to make a movie about movies set in this era that evokes that era that that transports you to that era but then is also able to use that real life uh, uh, th those real life event events in a way that is both uh, extremely satisfying but at the same time poignant at the same time very bittersweet uh, and and really ties the whole movie and its themes together at the end um, I think that uh, this was one of the most interesting movies uh, I've seen in a long time, and it's one that I'm going to return to for years and years, which I think is the mark of a great movie, that I can't wait to see it again, to go back to find new things, to experience it again. I think it was the movie-going experience of the summer. Hey, boys. Movie fight. 
Uh, you know how <laughs> when we really want to go watch a movie again and it's cinema, Dan, we don't call it watch again. We say revisit. That's what you say when you're talking about a really great film. You, gotta you don't just watch it, it yeah. again. You have to no. revisit You don't rewatch. You, you rewatch s- Good Boys. You yeah. revisit Once Upon a don't Time in Hollywood. <laughs> dare, dare cross Good Boys because like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, there's a lot of great elements of it. It's like it's like I'm looking at a guinea pig cage and you dress it up really nice and you put some cool cars in and some neat costumes, but the one problem <laughs> is that the guinea pig itself is dead. There's no, there's nothing there. There's no story there. It just took some real life events and it did the same switcheroo that we already saw with Inglorious Bastards and Spencer. That was God, a perfect analogy, the, Mark. Thank the, you. The, the, the dead guinea pig does not transfer to John Wick Parabellum because there's a lot of great action in there, but it's just another John Wick movie. We thought we were getting the closest great trilogy, and in the end, the movie got so desperate that it had to tell you, oh, but wait, maybe there is, oh, maybe it does come and back. Thank for God a there one. is, because there are questions that remained unanswered and knives that remain to be thrown at each other. Uh, I have to kind of take myself out of the, uh, the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood thing because I thought that movie was great but that movie is like catnip for the cinephile specifically the older cinephile living in Los Angeles who can look at that and be like oh my god that is what Hollywood was like in the 70s and oh I, I really how old do you think I am yeah you're <laughs> old <laughs> I wasn't alive during the, in 1969 you have the, you have the same vibe as a uh, Brad Pitt in the in the bathrobe you know yelling at people on his lawn that's 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 our catnip <laughs> thank you it, yeah that is <laughs> this is a film that is not universally accessible I think that the people who uh, came expecting kill bill I came expecting even Pulp Fiction left disappointed because it's like two hours of guys driving around in cars reminiscing and talking about the movie business and then a crazy ending. Well, it's, I don't think it's a movie that defies expectations that makes it a, a not a bad movie. As a matter of fact, it makes it a more interesting movie. And I hate it's. I keep getting this argument every time I talk about something being best. And somebody comes back to me and says, like, well, it's not accessible to everybody, so it can't be the best. That is bullshit. I'm sorry. That's wow. not how it works. Can we, can we swear on the show? I don't stuff, know anymore. The wow. best stuff is not the stuff that's the most accessible to anybody. As a matter of fact, that's usually the worst stuff. The I best, disagree. I think, I think it's harder to make that something that genuinely you. appeals to every person who comes to see it. You are not walking out of John Wick 3 without going, oh my gosh, I must revisit that film. I, did, uh, I, I walked out of John Wick 3 uh, in a position that I didn't think that I would be in, which was not that excited. Debating motorcycle versus No, horse. not being that excited for another John Wick movie. I, I, I'm got to be honest. I, just, I, I love the first two John Wick movies and you're right this has a lot of great scenes in John Wick chapter 3 but by the time we got to the end of it we'd gone to such a place it's just like I I, I thought we were wrapping it up and I'm like that's great because John Wick has shown me everything and I want to see this story well, end okay, and we got to the end of it and it was like ah, but nope there might be one more if you're in it thing. for the story regardless yes I I'm in it for the story Spencer that's part of making it a movie should have clo- it should have been the close to a great at the end of a great trilogy Spencer we want to see Ewoks high-fiving pilots oh, and yeah, everyone's favorite Storm part of Star Wars head. we <laughs> We want a nice <laughs> Walmart picture wrap up. We don't want to, hey, but we might come. That's Maze Runner stuff, man. <laughs> yeah. It's like, hey, don't bring the scorch the into movie, this. But maybe we got something else down the road. Look, there, there's nothing harder in the world of, in Dan's uh, uh, lexicon, cinema. There's nothing harder to do than make an audience laugh. It's very easy to bore the crap out of them with your own ego trip, watching Quentin Tarantino stroke himself for two and a half hours. That's an easy thing to do. There's a lot of great action set kind of pieces, there's a lot of cool stunts in John Wick 3. But it is so hard to make an audience laugh, particularly when you have little kids. Can they pull off these characters but still relate to kids and adults alike? That's why Good Boys was so magnificent, transcendent. It took some of the raunts you get from American Pie or Porky's or Superbad, but it combined it with a heart that you get in the best coming-of-age films, but like the, a Stand By Me or like a Breakfast Club. It the, meshes yeah, exactly. so many the, different the genres The foul mouth kids that actually have a heart at the end has been a trope since The Little Rascals. This has been good since Superbad. It worked in Booksmart even better this summer. But fighting people has never been done before. Not like it's been this. done better in two other John um, Wick movies. When have you seen uh, uh, two guys from the raid kick Keanu Reeves' ass and then pause before they could kill him because they want to keep fighting? That is an action movie first. I live on Hollywood and Vine. You see that nightly. <laughs> and by the way, I was stuck in traffic for 20 minutes when they were filming the scene in Once Upon a Time of them driving in Hollywood. So Everyone you may trans- say it's fixed. Well, look, I was in my 2018 Ford Fusion, did not make the final cut. Uh, Whoa, we got a fusion here. I, yeah, good boys, <laughs> At least. Good Boys is the second best version of a second rate good uh, super bad that came out this summer. Because mm-hmm. I agree. Book Smart was a better version of Super Bad than Ooh. Good Boys was, which was also pretty much a version of Super Bad. Um, I liked it. I liked the movie. I thought it was funny, but if I'm looking at the best movie of the summer, like it's it was it had it had laughs, but making an audience laugh. All I have to do is fart. 
It's not that hard. My it's body funny. literally does it on my own. If you do it right now, I'll give you the point. I will give you the point. If you fart on the mic right now. I have dignity, so I not degrade myself for a point on movie points. If you fart on this show, then you know what I'm going to do in a month? I'm going to revisit this episode of Movie Fights and enjoy it again. I've farted on this show before. That's your secret. Listen, yeah, good boys, it's it's fine. But I think that when you look at a movie that you're going to call the best movie of the summer, it's something that has to stand apart from the pack. John Wick Chapter 3 is a good action movie, but I don't think it's the best John Wick movie. And I think that there Strong are a lot disagree. of other big spectacle movies that did well this summer. It's the Good kind Boys. of spectacle. It's the spectacle where two dogs uh, murder an entire black ops unit uh, uh, sent by Halle Berry doing her best acting. Spinny, uh, listen to your final thoughts. Uh, final thought is, yes, I did come to the end of this well movie. Well done, Hal. Well I, done. <laughs> I came to the end of this I'm movie <laughs> and I was skeptical about John Wick 4, but that is not because John Wick 3 wasn't so good, sorry for the swear, uh, that was because I thought, how could they possibly top John Wick 3? We need to appreciate this movie in its time. Keanu is giving us his everything. This franchise is giving us its everything. And we need to appreciate it before his body falls apart like Tom Cruise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, how I feel like uh, a movie that stands away from the rest of the pack does not necessarily make it a great movie. It just separates the live guinea pigs from the one dead one <laughs> that nobody <laughs> should pay money to see. So at the end of the day, with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, just because it's different than every other movie does not make it better. The fact that Good Boys feels like a lot of different movies and it's just better than those, I think makes it elevated in this discussion. Now, as far as Spencer goes, I think that the Dobermans used in John Wick 3, that's a stereotype against Dobermans. People just look at them as these evil menacing dogs and Dobermans are very cute. They They're were very trained. cuddly. They were only oh, only on command. It's uh, you, you, It was like a, I'm not going to make a gun control analogy. Keep going. <laughs> Bottom line with no, that. Stops it Bad guy with a Doberman. Is it, look, they're saying that that is Walmart stopped selling Dobermans. They're, they're saying that Good Boys is the second funniest movie or the second best coming of age movie this summer. I would take that over the eighth best Tarantino movie or the third best John Wick movie. Mind you, there's only been three made so far. Whew. Damn. Uh, I'm sorry that you didn't like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I, actually I did, it. and I don't think that it is the eighth best Quentin Tarantino movie. It's, it's the actually ninth one best. Of my, it's one of my <laughs> more favorite Quentin Tarantino movies. You want the movie? Shut up. Uh, I, 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 I'm sorry that you looked at that uh, movie and saw a dead guinea pig. Uh, I did not. I saw a vibrant cage full of so many different guinea pigs that every time in I go look at that cage, with their feet out. Every time I go look at that cage, I'm going to look at those guinea pig feet, and I'm going to look at the <laughs> guinea pig set dressing, and I'm going to find a new guinea pig and something new to appreciate appreciate in that cage every time I go for it. Uh, that's another thing that I think makes a movie great is everybody looks at it and they see something different. I looked at Good Boys and I saw uh, 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 an average to a slightly above average comedy that I would lump in there with several other comedies that came out this summer. When I see John Wick Chapter 3, I see another entry in an action franchise that I definitely enjoy, but it felt a little long in the tooth to me. I was hoping it was going to give me a satisfying conclusion. It did not give me a satisfying conclusion, whereas Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was a meal and a half uh, and dessert. And by the way, you get a doggy bag to take home. I think it was a it was a cinematic feast, and I was there for every minute of it. Time! All right, boys. A lot of, uh... It's going to be back. That's oh, yeah. how I'll run the uh, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of... <laughs> A lot of sentences I've never, a lot of words I've never heard strung together before. Uh, my own metaphor is used uh, against me. <laughs> uh, I'll give my thoughts a second. Lon, we got wait, any facts that need to get looked at? A couple facts. Uh, those are actually not Dobermans in John Wick 3. They're German Belgian chef. Malinois. Oh. Malinois. Mm. They breed closely related to the <laughs> German Okay, okay. So there you go. Uh, I got them confused with the dogs in True Lies. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe. Also, not to it pick happens. on Mark, I, I looked around to see if I could find a guinea pig cage car accessory that was mentioned. I could not find one. Uh, I mean, any small car will do, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, you could then you're a not a good pig in, father. It's not a customary <laughs> guinea pig cage accessory, is what I'm saying. I won't even buy his pig. What, do you buy him a bike with training wheels? <laughs> yeah, that, I think a guinea pig might get some use out of a bike. Like, stationary, I could exercise. A car is not doing it any good. It's <laughs> yeah, a no, car, no, that's, that's absurd. <laughs> I'm more interested in this sub fight now than I am the best movie. Honestly, of the guinea summer. pig fights coming soon. Screen Something Junkies ridiculous. Plus. Uh, final, uh, Dan Merrill, born on January 4th, 1983, making him 36. Oh, yes. <laughs> Everyone dies. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks. Appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Mother's maiden name and his high school mascot. <laughs> my favorite teacher and my first pet. Or this. Mother's maiden Your name. Age was discussed during the fight. It's a relevant fact. Daniel. All I said was that I was not alive in 1960. <laughs> he has the spirit of a much older man. I, I don't think anyone. It's disputing yeah. that. <laughs> I'm accusing Dan of being old right now, and I'm not taking it back. And farts are funny. That's also a fact. Mm. Danielle? 
Yes. Where's your heart right now? What you thinking? Um, What's your vote? I have so many thoughts. There were a lot of analogies here. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know how guinea pigs work anymore. I thought <laughs> I did. That's fine. Um, th- great fight, first of all. Everyone was fantastic. You were all pinging and ponging off of each other um, very, very well. This was the battle of the stretched analogy, and <laughs> they were they were all fantastic. I wish I heard a little bit more about John Wick 3 itself and not so much about what this uh, potential sequel uh, for John Wick 3 was. Um, I have to say, I'm literally just basing it on all of the analogies at the end Dan put together the most coherent one with a thing about food which it, it would be eaten in the way that food is eaten and not hamsters in um, guinea pigs in dresses or whatever so I'm gonna go with Dan because that's what you guys gave me Dan's at the buffet he's on the board that's one lawn uh, I thought Mark came out with a really strong point like, I thought the opening about good boys was really strong and I thought his raunch plus heart sort of argument was really good, but then I thought Dan and Spencer really got him pretty good with that's the formula, that's the trope we're kind of used to, and then Booksmart also coming out this summer being another strong entry in the same genre, I think that really took him out, so it came down to Dan versus Spencer to me, and yeah, I I agree with Danielle, I thought Spencer made a lot of good arguments, but got kind of sidetracked by the John Wick as a as an entry in a larger yes. franchise as opposed to making the case for John Wick 3 itself. Ultimately, I thought Dan made just had the most to say and the most compelling arguments that weren't answered about his movie, so I'm going with Dan. Mm. Dan, you're taking this one. Yeah, I, uh, you know, my, my, my vote here doesn't really matter, but I, I gotta say, uh, A, uh, as the man who's much better at doing this than I am would say, great moment in sports, the guinea pig analogy. Uh, uh, Joe uh, Star is not that much better at this than you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I might say worse. I, but you, you, did, you did have the point simply because, you know, in the beach volleyball world of guinea pig analogies, he set it up, he spiked it, and you sent it right back, which I was, I did not see coming. Uh, there, there's a reason why you're the champ, uh, I would have given it to you to Dan. So Dan, first point on the board. Is that Hollywood Hell Runnings music? That is Hollywood yeah. Hell Runnings music. Oh my god! Oh, Get this oh, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> oh my god, he's got a chair! Let me bring this man to the stage right now. Uh, uh, he is, he's a legend in this space. Uh, he's the reason I have a job here. He's uh, he's a dear friend. I love him a lot. He's a good boy. He is a good boy. <laughs> he is very book smart. Nobody's guinea pig. He is parabellumed. <laughs> he's Hal Rudnick. Ladies and gentlemen, Woo! it's the leader of <laughs> Good to see you. Wow. Um, wait, so um, are we uh, like photoshopping my, we weren't photoshopping my face. It's going to be a deep fake. Yeah, yeah deep fake. Yeah, yeah, deep fake. <laughs> Weirdly, we're doing the Showgirls Honest trailer and your face was on my boobs. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. Fun fact. Uh, yeah. The only um, special effects during this taping are we're de-aging Merle to look like a 36-year-old man. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. I was uh, actually born in 1967. <laughs> <laughs> that, oh, crap. That Showgirls Honest trailer, I got to live my dream of Hal Rudnick pasties existing <laughs> uh, in the world. And um, all right, uh, guys, uh, wow. wow. This is a great moment in sports. Um, <laughs> Let's start over. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, John Wick. Wow. So, well, marmosets. They're these yeah. small furry creatures. They I, have costumes. I, look, I feel refreshed because I feel like I was in Vegas at the blackjack dealer and I lost a hand and I didn't really like the way, I yeah. didn't like the dealer's Bad tone. Vibes. Bad vibes. But now we got a new dealer in there and it's a new movie fight. Yeah. Hoot, hoot, uh, hashtag Al Nation, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Movie Fights. That first question, let's throw it in the trash. Let's start. Zero. No, it counts. All right, here we go. Um, you guys, so it's Dan one, Spencer zero, Mark zero. Yeah. Looking to get on the board. Glad to be here. Lon Dan calling. Great to see you. We're also let's jump into round two. All right. So uh, we just addressed the question: What is the best movie? of 2019 thus far. Now let's posit the question. What's the worst movie of summer 2019? There it is. And uh, it's question number two. So uh, let's uh, start with player number two. Spencer Gilbert. Yeah, this is the X-Men Dork Phoenix. Ooh, boy. This one. (laughs) Dork's added. Uh, (laughs) This film, it was like the X-Men died and the cast of the X-Men showed up to the funeral and they taped it and released it as a feature film. This was the most joyless, dour, slipshod, crap version of the X-Men we've seen. That's saying something. I have ever so much more to say about it, but uh, I think uh, I will hold back until I hear uh, uh, Mark's bad take. 
Is it my turn? Oh no, no. it's uh, it's it's Dan's turn. Oh okay. Yes. yes. Uh, at, at least your joyless movie had dark in the title. Mm. Mine was joyless, uh, but full of things that should have given everyone joy. My pick is Men in Black International. Mm. Good grief! What a waste of talent of everything you could possibly imagine in this movie. I sat through it, I got to the end of it, and I realized I hadn't cracked a smile once. Uh, the, the, the action scenes were completely inert, which is unbelievable considering that F. Gary Gray directed this movie. And say what you will about things like the, you know, the Fast and the Furious movies, the more recent ones, but the one thing they never were were boring and inert and devoid of any interesting action. I mean, he is such a propulsive filmmaker. And the fact that you have him directing Men in Black and National, uh, with no energy or joy to it whatsoever. You have Chris Hemsworth and Tessa Thompson, two of our more charismatic actors. We've seen how good they are on screen together before in Thor Ragnarok. Uh, no charisma. You have Kumail Nanjiani, uh, nothing. Rebecca Ferguson, nothing. Just a complete waste of everything, of all the talent on display there. Uh, and that's why it's my worst of the summer. All right. Thank you, Dan. Mark Ellis. How history is littered with that time in a celebrity's life when they went crazy. You have your your Gary Buseys, your Nicholas Cages, your Mel Gibson. So you're going to hear my answer. You're going to say, hey, was old Mark Ellis drinking at Moonshadows in Malibu before he came over here? Is this the day that Mark Ellis gets taken down a peg? The answer is no, although my opinion is going to be controversial. Because the question is, what is the worst movie of the summer of 2019? And that question was posited in early September. So this might not have been my answer a month ago. This might not be my answer right now from now. However, as it currently stands in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, with Spider-Man no longer being welcome to the party, the worst movie of the summer is Spider-Man Far From Home. Wow. This movie sets up a world where Spider-Man is taking the reins from Mr. Tony Stark, and we're going to go off to Phase 4 and have a bunch of new adventures with this guy leading us, and then wouldn't you know it, real life intrudes, legal debates ensue, producer credits don't get given, and Spider-Man is now out of the MCU. So that entire movie was a wasted exercise in setting up Spider-Man to be in more movies. Now, they may work out a deal, and I could take some of this back, mm -hmm. but as it stands right now, we just got a movie that is two hours of promising us something that will definitely not happen as of today in the MCU, on top of the fact that the movie was... <laughs> Yeah. All right, Mark. You know, I have to say the uh, internet collectively gasped when yes, you gave your answer, but now we see you have a method to your madness. Thank we shall you. see. Fight it out, everybody. Uh, Spider-Man Far From Home, is, I, first of all, I thought was a really enjoyable movie, and I know that's not what you're fighting on, but I also think that nothing about the off, the current off-screen negotiations, which may or may not reflect the future of Spider-Man in three to five years, should have any bearing on, on the movie as it stands. And secondly, this whole thing about the setup that still can't pay off, uh, I disagree with that. The most exciting developments that were set up for Spider-Man uh, didn't have anything to do with the MCU. I didn't think. I thought it was all about. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't want to get too far. Peter into spoilers, Parker. But but all about Spider Man mm, the character yeah. and Peter Parker the character and where he goes. Not you know he didn't like you know land at Avengers at headquarters and be like. Hey, I'm an Avenger now. Let's go, Let's rest assemble. of the Marvel team. Uh, and to add on to that, nothing that's been announced so far is Spider-Man dependent. The Phase Four stuff is like, is he? Does he have to be in Black Panther two? No. Does he have to be in the Eternals? Shang Chi? Like that doesn't need Spider-Man to work. No, they don't initially. But we have a hero that is a bankable star that we get nothing of. You don't feel the slightest bit duped. This entire movie was not a standalone Spider-Man movie. This was a movie that says firmly, hey, Spider-Man is not only MC in the MCU, he's going to be leading the charge into Phase 4, and on top of that, we get this villain that was the worst bait and switch in history with Jake Gyllenhaal's Mysterio. Dorf Goes Fishing has better baits and switches than what we got with Mysterio. We all knew he was a bad guy when he shows up, so we have to put up with That's the first hour a nerd. of him. Everybody <laughs> could tell there was going to be something else to this character, and what is his super villain power? How does he defeat the best Earth has to offer special effects. It was better when it was Brian Brown and Brian Dennehy in FX 1 and 2. That's a movie about special effects working. This was just a tired film that now has its bankable star out of the entire galaxy, and I want my money back. I know you're saying it's tired, but it seems like your main problem is that you liked it so much you're upset that you won't get to see it pay off later. You won't get to see the continuation of the movie you As watched. it stands today, I wanted Spider-Man in the MCU. We didn't get it. You can't say you that about the it. Men in Blacks. You, you got it. You that. won't get. You might not get it, but you got it. As yeah. it stands today, I'm a 
a broken hearted child that wanted more Spider Man. And I didn't get it how that did not happen in Men in Black. We could have other Men in Black adventures. We could have other adventures in X Men. And we're going to have more Spider Man adventures. And we're going to. With Tom Holland. (laughs) And the same cast, and maybe the same director, and the same writers. It just might not have happened. Dan, gentlemen's agreement to ignore Mark from now on? Um, one last thing. <laughs> one last thing. The bait and switch with Mysterio I thought was great because it was a double bait and switch because yes, everybody knew going in that he was the villain, but then it was a double switch because they reveal the tie to what it had and that was what allowed Spider-Man to complete his arc because it was all about coming to terms with Tony Stark's legacy, including Mysterio. And by closing that loop, they did, and honestly, if I had my druthers, would I want him to continue? Sure. But they closed that loop in this movie. Okay. They gave you the emotional Who under the age of 70 says, if I had my druthers. You are clearly an old man. <laughs> <laughs> this is all, this 36 year old His age was established earlier. Long, as look as up so. the birth certificate anyway, again. Let's talk about Dark Phoenix. Yes, yeah, let's, uh, please. Simon uh, Kinberg should be in prison, not movie prison, real prison where you get hit in the head with a <laughs> tube sock full uh, of soap. Uh, flash. <laughs> to all our ships at sea, X-Men movie falls flat on its face. What a shocker. That's only happened five or six times yeah, that, before. That's so much more egregious because this is a guy who had a chance with The Last Stand to tell the Dark Phoenix story. He's like, guys, I'm sorry. I saw everything that went wrong. I got it this time. And again, like Lucy with the football, except there's no football and she's just punching Charlie Brown in the groin and he keeps signing up for more groin punches. I don't know where that analogy came from. Yeah, I, I, no, I'm not helping you with this one. <laughs> but I just got guinea pigs. Dark Phoenix was a poor little orphan child. Dark Phoenix was left out on the street. Yeah, hundred million dollar orphan when, child. When their studio was bought, and, it, and they realized that Papa Diz, Papa Mickey didn't want them. Uh, and so, can you can you blame it that maybe it wasn't a perfect movie? Isn't and that a sadder result though of all these people just dead men walking, just waiting for the movie to end? At least Men in Black, they their charisma was you know pissing into the ocean and failing, but at least they were trying to make something. But Chris Hemsworth hired his own dialogue writer because he's like, I want this movie to work. I don't want this to be a failure. Everybody else in X-Men Dark Phoenix could not wait to get out of there. Well, yeah, I know. That's what I mean. It's like, that's not really sad. If they gave up on it, the studio gave up on it, then that's kind of what you would expect, as opposed to, like, Men in Black International. Everybody there was trying their hardest. I'd rather watch people people try. Terrible. No, it's nothing is worse than watching people try so hard to be funny and charismatic, and it just sits there on the screen. It's depressing in a way that Dark Phoenix is not. Oh, Dark Phoenix is depressing. The whole thing is a, a series of revelations that someone has died, and they just stand her and go, Gene is dead. Raven is dead. Oh, Magneto, he might be dead. Ooh. At the very least, oh, Spider Man, he's alive and well, but you're just not going to get him again. Yes, anymore. you are. Just he's, not with Happy Home. Oh, Venom. good. He can uh, hang out with Venom. Yeah. Who can't wait for that one? That uh, movie's going to be a too. turd rolling in the wind, and we had Spider Man. Look, Dark Phoenix is a bad movie, and Man in Black International is a bad movie, but you're right. At least they put forth an effort, and at least with Dark Phoenix, they were closing up mercifully. They were putting this thing to sleep. With Spider-Man, they came out and they they made this huge announcement that now they have to renege on. This is like an eternal sunshine of the spotless mind situation. You had this hot girlfriend and now no longer enjoying the, the, the hangout. She's done. She's moved on. She's going somewhere else. And I think that if you could have your druthers, you would say remove that shit from my brain and the MCU would want to do over. I'm trying to follow that analogy too. So wait, th- th- there's other there's other girls in the MCU. There's oh. other, well, there's Black Widow. Spider-Man there's is the a- most attractive <laughs> girlfriend. Right. So Spider-Man's in the, the MCU. girlfriend. But there's plenty of other MCU people who can take on the mantle of the Did you hear the crowd go crazy at the end of Endgame when Spider-Man shows up again? They were happy for everything. They went crazy Spider-Man, for everything. They, they clapped when in. Thor came out looking like the Bowski. They clapped when Thanos took a dump. They clapped at every stupid it's moment. Spider-Man they saved part. for the end. They yeah. saved Spider-Man for the headline like look I'm back I'm Spider-Man I'm the one that's gonna take it through phase four you were never promised that with Dark Phoenix Dark Phoenix it's I, you know what Hal I am honestly no, they were planning a trilogy that Dark I think? Phoenix this got made because Dark Phoenix was on the shelf for a while they had to do a bunch of reshoots just the fact that this ragtag yeah. group of mutants could come together and put together two hours of anything on celluloid is a magnificent <laughs> that's what it looks like it looks like two people a ragtag group tried to put together everything anything on celluloid there was a fight sequence about crossing the street 
the whole third act was about a train because it was too similar to Captain Marvel. So like, uh, a train, sure, that'll work. They, they, The whole movie revolves around Jean Grey and who she really is, and is she the Jean we know or love? We don't know Jean Grey! She showed up in Apocalypse and was like, hi, I'm Jean Grey, and then it was over. That We have no idea who this character was about. They flubbed the whole thing again. Simon Kimberg, I, I guess, I don't know why he was directing us. He was directing he's it. he's been around a long time. Because he's been around long enough, so it's his turn, and they're like, okay, might as well. Here, tip, if you're gonna start directing, don't start with the multi-hundred million dollar superhero franchise film. It turns out that there's, a, people sort of need to know what they're doing, otherwise everyone just stands around, straining, looking like uh, absolute assholes, hoping that the CGI will come save them later and make them look cool. It doesn't. The whole film is just a series of, ah, ah, Roll this into your final thought, Spencer. This is my final thought. Yeah. <laughs> that for imagine that for 140 minutes. Yeah, people trying to go to the bathroom for 140 <laughs> minutes. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, Dan, let's Dark get Phoenix your final thoughts. Dark Phoenix was the thoughts. latest disappointment in a long string of disappointments from the X Men franchise. It's no surprise that they that they whiffed it. Uh, I, I don't think it was as atrocious as some of the other X Men movies could be. And honestly, I expected it to not be that good. Uh, Men in Black International was a top tier action filmmaker who just guided the Fast and Furious franchise uh, to I think their biggest hit internationally, a billion dollar hit with two. Two of the top stars working today with Tessa Thompson and uh, and Chris Hemsworth, uh, with all of that might, uh, with no challenges in their way, no studio drama as far as getting sold, no no like reshoots, no we had to reshoot the third act, just pure talent, and they came up with nothing, absolutely nothing. I think that's what makes it the worst movie of the summer, is absent the, the, those huge challenges that, that, that Dark Phoenix had, uh, they still were able to come up with anything. That's, that's a squandering of talent, and it's a waste of resources. Uh, it's joyless to sit through. X-Men at least gave us that first 10 minutes, which is a great X-Men sequence. At the very least, I can say, like, well, Dark Phoenix may not have been great, but I love that space sequence. That's a great one of them using their powers. There's something for me to cling on to. Nothing for me to cling on to in Men in Black International. Spider-Man Far From Home is a good movie. Movie. The off-screen politics of it, if uh, next year or next week they change this deal, then, then, the, then the argument is moot. It doesn't change anything about what's in the movie. We're still going to get Spider-Man. We're going to get this Spider-Man again. It may not be tied to the MCU, but that doesn't change anything about what's in this movie. And they're free to explore what I think was the, was the cliffhanger of the film and the most interesting thing about Spider-Man in the next film anyway. So I think it's a stumbling block at best and may not even be an issue at all. You know how, Thanks, um, looking around this room, and I look at my panels, I look at you, I look at the, the gang on the couch, Personal. the engineers, I look at uh, the, the thing, and I say, look, <laughs> we all have experienced heartbreak in our life. And so that, that famous quote from that author that's not Robert Frost, somebody else, it's better to have loved and lost than to not have loved at all. I yeah. think anybody that's ever been through heartbreak would disagree with that. You would rather not love at all than you would have your heart ripped to pieces. Now, these two movies we're talking about, are they the worst movies of the summer, or is it my panelist's fault for walking in with expectations and hoping that they would be good. We all walked into Spider-Man, and we walked out saying, hey, we are excited about it, and then you know what happened? Our heart got broken. These movies were bad, but Spider-Man's the only one that broke our heart. Men in Black's not good, Dark Phoenix is not good, but Spider-Man's the only movie that said, you know what, kids, we hope you enjoyed your time with Papa, because he's not coming home anymore. Uh, Ring-a-ding-ding, that's time. <laughs> all right, uh, which one is the worst of the summer? Lon, do you have some facts for us, including uh, who that quote comes from? It's Alfred Lord Tennyson. Damn. Oh. Oh. It was either Tennyson. Alfred Lord Tennyson? <laughs> yeah. Tennyson's a Benny. He's one of the greats. They call him yeah. Al his first name was Alfred. So Alfred, comma, Lord Tennyson. Uh, was he a lord or is Lord his middle name? No, no, he's a lord, like an English lord. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank like you. A member yeah. of the nobility. I was, not Lord Alfred Tennyson. Tennyson. Was on, it was a 50 50 shot between him and Sammy Hagar. I could not remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I oh, you're confusing him with uh, I Can't Drive 55. Yeah. Alfred Lord Tennyson. I, I was going to say, drove. how do I know what it's love? Should I call him like Ian Sir McKellen? Yeah, right. right. Why is yeah. Yeah. Sir, Sir, yeah, Sir, a Sir is a knight, knightly title. It's not. It's not the same as being a member of the uh, chivalry gentry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank I you for your knowledge you. of British royalty. You're Please welcome. continue on. Uh, so, Sony Pictures chief Tony Vinciguerra said today that quote 
for the moment the door is closed on Spider-Man rejoining the, EU, the MCU, but he added, it's a long life. So he's leaving the door it's a long slightly life. ajar for, for the possibility of more Spider-Man MCU movies. Finally, Druthers, actually short for I'd Rather, I guess if you pronounce it I'd Rather, uh, popularized around the turn of the century in Little Abner comics. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Little Abner. Dan was there. <laughs> Wait, well, the turn of what century? The 1900s? 1910s and, and 1920s. Yeah, this guy's like 100 years old would have been. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, Johnny Reeves and I have been trying yes. through time. It's not <laughs> fair. Yeah, he's just using some throwbacks. Okay, uh, Lon, thank Lincoln you for that. Lincoln and Douglas, and now we have to fight him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's seen so, so many more talkies than we have. <laughs> um, Mark, you know what? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I see where you went, and I didn't follow you there. Fair enough. Uh, not uh, a lot of people out there did either, but the ones that did, the party's at Shakey's Pizza on La Brea. <laughs> I am, I, I, I for one, agree agree with uh, um, Alfred Lord Tennyson, it is better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at yeah, all. Yeah, you're, you're in a happy, productive relationship. Uh, yeah, I just got married a couple months ago. Yeah, 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 so nobody uh, should take your advice. Uh, true, that is that is true on many counts. But uh, for this, um, Mark, um, I appreciate the creativity to your mm -hmm. to your fight. But it was it was it was a fun movie. It was a good movie. Um, so it came down to me to uh, Spencer and Dan, and um, uh, you guys both had uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot of moxie to what you were talking about there. You really believed that th these were joyless slogs, and they both were. So it just came uh, down to me who painted the more joyless picture. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, Spencer, uh, at the end, you won me over with the fact that the protagonist, we didn't know her, yet she was posited as this uh, character that we were supposed to really get on board with, and it was in just an intensely joyless bad movie. I like just the like the the orphan analogy. Uh, I was disappointed with uh, so much from the director to the um, the lack of chemistry with the cast, Dan. But yeah, Spencer got it for me. Uh, Lon, uh, where are you? Uh, I, I mostly agree with you, Hal. I thought, yeah, Mark, it was it was a noble effort, but kind of in your opening statement, you said the movie was just eh, and we had two guys at the table who were making very strong cases for why their movies were. Terrible, which I think like is worse than the sound. I mean, I actually think the movie's good. <laughs> it's just, it's, it just, it, yeah. it Temple of Doomed my heart. Up. I understand. Yeah. No, it's, it, yeah. But uh, so, so I kind of, I kind of had to move beyond that. So it really came down to these two. Uh, I thought it was very close, but yeah, I agree with Hal that I thought Spencer really pulled it out with a very strong argument there at the end. Got a lot of reasons why the movie didn't pay off. Sort of like underlying reasons why it was a failure. I'm going with Spencer. All right. Um, Danielle, uh, did you have any uh, thoughts uh, on uh, oh, well, this battle? Uh, my major thoughts would have been like, um, great, great job, uh, great attempt, great, really <laughs> funny argument, but yeah, they knocked him out super early. To who um, were you talking about? I, you, I couldn't. Oh, I love you. <laughs> gotcha. It's you, my love, right there. Gotcha. Um, and I just, I wish I would have heard a little bit more about um, specifics about Men in Black International. I cannot remember it. There you go. I think you purged it as soon as you were done watching yes, it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would have agreed and went with Spencer as well. Right on. Thank you, Danielle. So Spencer, you got that Boom. point. So it is Dan one, Spencer one. We each have Mark a point, Hal. We, we each have a point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know okay. what? I got here late, but one not that one. late. Hey. Come on. Um, so uh, it's one one. Mark looking to get on the board. Thank you very much. Wait, if you're here and I'm here, who's Babysitting the twins. Oh, <laughs> rudderless ship. Okay. Uh, question number three. Here we go. We ask you, which MCU Phase Four movie will end up being the breakout hit? All right. Which MCU movie will end up being uh, just like lighting the world on fire? And we start with uh, player number three. Since question three, Dan. Yeah, it's weird. The MCU is kind of going into the great unknown, and so uh, there's a lot of unproven uh, quantities, and then some people that are getting movies that we've we haven't seen a whole lot of. And so I went with uh, the second Doctor Strange movie, which is coming out. I honestly think when I'm looking at it in the, the multiverse of madness, the, the the possibilities are are unlimited. And I think coming off of Endgame, that concept played so well. 
the idea of when they went back to the time heist and the idea of all these splintering branches, the, the Loki show is kind of based off of that. Um, you know, that's going to be kind of fresh in people's minds. I think by the time Doctor Strange comes out, people will have seen the Loki, the Loki idea of things branching off and splintering. And also the, 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 the limits of what the movie can be. I think are so wide and so far reaching. I don't think it's just going to be Doctor Strange. Uh, I think that it's going to be Doctor Strange folding in a lot of other characters, which has worked well for a lot of movies before. Uh, and, and I'll take that as my pick for the unknown hit over the unknown quantities, because that's worked uh, recently with Captain Marvel and with Black Panther, but I think it's just as likely uh, to not work. I think that when you're looking for the one that's got the potential to be a breakout hit, because these are pro probably all going to make money, let's be honest, but the breakout hit, I'm going to go with the concept that I believe has the most possibilities, that can fold in the most characters, interesting characters, characters from different time periods of the MCU. Uh, it's going to be a different tone. They said it's going to be more kind of a horror film. I think it's going to be very unique, very different very interesting, and I think that could lead it to really break out of the mold uh, and build on what Doctor Strange built in the first film. All right, we'll hear more from you in a moment. Uh, Mark, which of these movie, which movie will be uh, basically the old town road of the MCU? <laughs> I mean, how all I heard in Dan's argument is that he really wishes Spider-Man could have been in the Doctor Strange movie. It's just not going to happen, Dan. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the breakout hit is going to be Shang-Chi. That is going to be the movie that is the biggest breakout hit of Phase 4. Now, you may be looking at me and you say, well, Mark, what do you know about Shang-Chi? The answer is not a lot. I do not know a lot about Shang-Chi, the property. I did not read the comics, nor did I grow up being aware of this character. However, Hal, I will say this, is that if you're looking for a breakout hit, Shang-Chi checks all of the boxes more so than any other film what are those in boxes? Phase 4. Those boxes are international box office appeal because the character, his daddy's Chinese, and Chinese dollars make big waves at the box office if you can capitalize on that market. And guess what? His mom, get this, white woman. Women love going to the movies when they're involved, <laughs> and they're going to be involved in the making of Shang-Chi. And so not only do we get China, do we get the female demographic, we also, you know where he has to go confront somebody? Ooh, New York me. City, Manhattan. We're getting the biggest, that's the greatest <laughs> city in the world. We're going to be trekking the globe with Shang-Chi. Well, I just want to make sure I have this right. So the, the boxes are international Chinese Inter appeal. You know what? You could have stopped at international. Mom. <laughs> the, the fact that we and have a New York, so New many York. different All the boxes. demographics <laughs> are being involved in this movie. And so I think that this has the potential to be the biggest box office hit. You didn't ask me what's going to be the best movie. You didn't ask me uh, yes. what is going to be the best story. You asked me what is going to be the breakout hit. And Shang-Chi, the definition mm -hmm. of a breakout hit is a movie that we thought yeah, it came out of nowhere. Look at all the money it made. That is Shang-Chi to AT. All right. I'm feeling that. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Spencer, what do you got? Yeah, I'm afraid we're going to descend into the uh, the multiverse of schematics here because I picked mine based on my definition of a breakout hit, which is that something you wouldn't expect to do well. And like I, a Shang-Chi. Uh, I would expect a Shang-Chi, for the reasons you mentioned, to <laughs> do okay because moms uh, are uh, will always see a movie with another white <laughs> they mom. They have in it. wallets. <laughs> yeah, moms for, the record, have wallets. for the record, they're Marvel movies. I expect them all to do yeah, <laughs> somewhat well. I expect them all to do well, yeah. but uh, as little as uh, Mark knows about Shang-Chi, I know even less about The Eternals. Oh, thank God. Um, I think that I have no idea what this film is about. I know that these are the godlike, uh, uh, more uh, powerful beings in the MCU. Um, they are uh, very strong and uh, large. <laughs> we learn even less from that image. Oh, I've got, but I've, <laughs> I thought that image would say. Yeah. <laughs> yep, no Angelina Jolie up there. Just the name of the movie. <laughs> I, wish I don't have notes in front of me. Spencer has notes and a pen. My notes could have say it's just down. dumb things you've said. I have, these are not my notes. Uh, I think that this, uh, don't, don't bet against Marvel. I learned this lesson in Phase two, where Guardians of the Galaxy, something else I had not heard about, but this was this sounded so bizarre and so out there that that's what people are the most curious about, and that's what people end up seeing more than you'd expect them to. Is like, wow, an MCU movie that doesn't feel like any of the other ones. I've seen origin stories. I've seen um, uh, uh, the horrible Iron Fist Netflix movie. I've seen their their street level kung fu takes. This is not a white guy. I'm just, he's, I agree. He's half white. <laughs> yes, he's half white. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's open it up. Fight you guys. I've, I've been opening it up. And yeah. then the, the uh, Doctor Strange two, like that's that's not a breakout. I think the expectations of Doctor Strange two are already super high. It's gonna have Scarlet Witch in it, and it might not even do as well because there's even rumors, I believe, that it might be rated R. 
Is that true? I don't think Disney would allow that to happen. I haven't read those rumors. Uh, I, I can't imagine an MCU proper movie being rated. But the right. horror genre, if anything, could suppress its uh, mass appeal the, uh, to me rather than be like, oh, let's all take the kids to see a horror movie. Yes, it did horribly. Uh, which was rated R and yet still made a bunch of money. Uh, PG-13 Apples to oranges, MCU to it. But I'm just saying, horror movies didn't preclude a huge audience. A huge audience will show up to see the right horror movie. Uh, I think that people will show up to see something different. Yeah, like the, the Eternals. Who knows what they are? <laughs> They're big godlike people. Like that's the thing. You're already confused by them. No, I'm 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 completely ignorant. I'm in blissful ignorance about them. The I, thing that people <laughs> liked about Guardians of the Galaxy at the end of the day, even though we looked at it and we were like what is that was that they were able to ground them strangely and make them relatable yeah and i don't know if you can do that with eternals these godlike beings i don't know if you can ground them enough that the average person is going to look at it and say like oh i connected well, that well they do that i mean you get you think that that's the way they're going to go with angelina jolie but she's pulled that off in something like maleficent where she is this otherworldly evil force but then it turns out oh she wanted to kidnap a Princess, make her her daughter. I don't, it's been a long time. I haven't seen that movie. In a, while. Um, a very relatable feeling, though. Very relatable feeling. But I, I think that's where they struggled with Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel is their um, most powerful character, I think, thus far introduced. And I think that's where the movie struggled was relating to her and well, finding but, a way to get the audience to relate to her because she's so powerful. Because there wasn't anyone for her to uh, bounce off against. The Eternals, as I recall, is plural, so that means there's more than one of them. There's more than one Eternal. They're going to face off. They're going to have uh, friends. There's going to gonna enemies, be a lot of Eternals. Yeah. In Eternal the film. on Eternal Eternals. action. But here's the thing. A bunch of gods. The, it's just, uh, it's, it's, gods. it's a know. bunch of gods. The reason why Guardians of the Galaxy was such a breakout hit is because that movie had some funny in it. It had a a lot of humor and it had a talking raccoon. Now there's no talking mm. raccoons that are going to be in Eternals unless the, unless Rocket shows up in Eternals, which is still not going to do what Guardians of the Galaxy did. And as far as the Doctor Strange movie goes, I do agree with Spencer's point that this Scott Derrickson said he wants this to be a horror movie. If it is rated R, it could do well. It could do boffo box office, but it does not have the same appeal as another horror film like it does internationally. It did very well, but this is not it. This is something totally different. This, in the terms of the MCU, is going to be what is the international, what is the thing that's going to take over the globe, and the fact that we have a superhero that is of a nationality that we have never seen represented in this way in the MCU is going to be the biggest boon for this thing, not only doing well in the United States, as we know all MCU movies are going to do, this is going to have international appeal far and beyond Eternal. I don't know if people are going to see Eternals on Jupiter or in Mars, okay? But I know that people on Earth care about Shang-Chi, and they care about it all but over all this MCU. Great all Land MCU movies do great in China. Yeah, like that's not say. that's not a shocking thing. It's like, going it to do better be... when you get to see yourself on screen for the first time. We've seen evidence of that. If you have a female superhero that is leading a movie, if you have somebody like Black Panther who is leading a movie, and finally a huge demographic can go see, hey, that could be me up there. That's what Shang Chi is going to do. That uh, Doctor Strange has. Not, there's a lot of white guys that wear capes I, already. But, but there there's a lot, lot of, of people from outer space already. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that everyone in China is going to go see the movie because there's a Chinese person in it because there are a lot of Chinese action movies that already come out in China starring Chinese people. It's not a novelty that somebody made it. There's more movies. But they don't tie movies. into the biggest franchise on Earth. Those action movies but I'm not have say no like, ties oh, well, to the going to do great in China because it has a Chinese lead. There's a lot of really good Chinese and Hong Kong action movies that come out in China every year. Uh, uh, way more than come out here. But they don't have the budgets that the mouse does. They do. They, and they do. And yeah, the they do, actually. China, money. China makes China Wandering makes movies, Earth is insane. China makes action movies now domestically on their own that have bigger budgets and are bigger spectacles than than Shang Chi is going to be. Yeah, to see Matt Damon's The Wall. <laughs> There's Chinese production companies that have more money to spend than Disney. Yes. Yeah, Wolf Warrior 2 is, is a bigger spectacle, is a massive hit in China, uh, an action movie that came out in China uh, that is that is, has a bigger, probably, spectacle than Shang-Chi is going to have. Spectacle's one like, thing, but as far as putting budget and putting an international promotion thing, because again, I said it's going to do well in China, not just China, though. This is going to be something all over the globe, where again, I think that your movie, uh, primarily, I'm very excited to see it, I think it's going to do its best business in the United States, and I think The Eternals is going to do, I, I just don't know enough Who about Who knows? Eternals. That's why it would be 
be a breakout. I think we're losing perspective here of the the potential and the possibility of these films. Just because and we know the least about your movie yeah, doesn't that's, mean that, that it, it has, has the, the lowest ceiling. floor. So <laughs> yes. of course, uh, it, Dan, why don't you uh, hit us with some final thoughts? Uh, yeah, I also think that's the most likely to just plunge through the bottom. It has a very low floor. So if it does uh, well, breakout hit. No, it's coming. not a breakout hit. It's it's like uh, oh, I guess it did okay. Uh, a breakout hit, I think, is something that makes people stand up and go, "Wow!" For example, Thor Ragnarok to me was a breakout hit. Not only because it did a lot of money, but because people looked at the character in a new way, recontextualized it, it was something different and new, and people really uh, uh, completely changed their idea of what Thor was, of what that franchise was, based on that movie. I think that was a breakout hit in a genre where uh, uh, all of their movies make a bunch of money. Um, if Shang-Chi does well in China, again, Marvel movies do well in China. I don't think it's going to be as big a deal in China as it is here because, like I said, uh, Chinese action stars uh, exist in China already, and, and and there are a lot of great Chinese action movies that get made. Uh, I don't think it's a there it's a draw just because it stars somebody from China. I love that there is representation uh, from that demographic in the MCU. I think that's a great point, but I don't think that's necessarily like oh, it's going to be a breakout hit. Um, I think it's also just as likely that it's going to be kind of generic. I mean, you've got the Mandarin, the Ten Rings, the Mandarin is a villain that you're going to have to retcon that people are already Another not excited story. about. Uh, you know, you have to figure out, like, this is like their third Mandarin, potentially. Um, they're trying to kind of haphazardly, clumsily tie it into Iron Man. I think you can go wrong there. Doctor Strange and, and the, the Multiverse of Madness, I think, allows infinite possibilities, and like Thor Ragnarok did, can completely recontextualize how people think of that character, and that's what I define as a breakout hit, something that makes people go like, oh, you know, the first movie was okay, but that movie really makes me excited about the future of this character, and they really did something fun and special and unique, and that's why I picked that movie. Sorry. Thank you, Dan Merle. Mark. Sure, how Wait, did I get skipped? Breakout hit. <laughs> oh, no, we're going to come around the horn to you. Don't a worry. Breakout hit can subvert expectations in something we're already aware of, but I don't see that potential with Doctor Strange. I see Doctor Strange maybe going or maybe going a darker route is going to handcuff it more for an international or for even a national audience that is just in the United States wanting to go see that movie. With the Eternals, I, that, that, that reeks of like a, we're trying too hard to either be Guardians of the Galaxy, which audiences are smart, they'll sniff it out, or it just reeks of like a Fantastic Four hey, we tried to do another comic book and it didn't work out, so let's get rid of this thing real quick. With Shang-Chi, you have the ability, like what Wonder Woman did, when you have a giant demographic of people never got to see themselves on screen before in that way. Same thing with Black Panther. They never got to see themselves on screen that way before. Yes, there's been plenty of movies that have Asian leads that are kick-ass action movies. None of them have occurred in the biggest franchise on Earth right now, and that is the MCU. I know there's a lot of movies that do well in China that we never hear about here in the United States. Shang-Chi is going to be the one that unites all of them together, and I think the fact that the Mandarin is the villain in this movie, which I just got that update, is that we finally get to see. There's so many fans who wanted to see the Mandarin done right, done justice, and now we have the chance to do that, so that's going to get even more people into the theater. This is the breakout hit. This is what's going to surprise people. You didn't know Shang-Chi was before. You're going to know who he is afterwards. Thank you, Mark. Mark Ellis, I just Spence. I think the other two are gimmies. I think if all of these uh, all of these films all made say a billion dollars, uh, uh, Shang Chi debuts to a billion dollars. Oh yeah, of course China showed up and it, and it crossed that line. Doctor Strange too. Yeah, duh. Okay, I can see that making a billion dollars. The Eternals. What is the Eternals? How did that movie make a billion dollars? It's the breakout hit of Phase Four, baby. We got a breakout hit on our hands. <laughs> Dick Vitale. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> thank you, Spencer. Ring a ding ding. Uh, Lon, uh, what do you got in the fact zone? Oh, got a few. Oh, sorry. I'm just talking. Okay. Uh, first of all, the definition of breakout being or relating to a sudden or smashing success, especially in comparison to previous efforts. Just wanted to get that out mm. there. A lot of the debate uh, centered around it. Speaking of which, I thought. Uh, oh, a couple more facts. Uh, Doctor Strange 2, very likely to be PG-13, despite having a horror movie tone. That's what we're hearing from around the web. Uh, I have to say, uh, the Eternals, human-looking. AV Club says they're very beautiful <laughs> humans who live forever and have superpowers, not giants or whatever else is being <laughs> suggested. And finally, uh, despite uh, everything that was said, mostly about, you know, there are big Chinese huge spectacle action movies. They make a ton of money. They're very popular. They do star Chinese actors. They do tend to have budgets that are a lot lower than their American counterparts. Wolf Warrior 2 had a budget of about 30 million. Wandering Earth had a budget of about 50 million. 30 million dollars! Captain Marvel was 152 million. 
billion dollar budget for 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 compare. But if you adjust for inflation, when Dan yeah. was going to high school in 1907, 30 million dollars <laughs> back then. Back when they said druthers. That was uh, the wrong yeah. uh, Lon, uh, what are your thoughts? Keep rolling it. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought. I mean, in, interesting arguments all around. I feel like Spencer. It was a little thin. It was mostly like I don't know what the Eternals are. So he needed good. that picture. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, he was really big oh, that visually. Yeah. Yeah. Who, whoever pulled the image effed him. Yeah. <laughs> Give me some blood. It just kind of came down to semantics around the word breakout too much, so I, I, I didn't really think of that word. I thought I thought Mark had a really good argument in terms of representation. This movie's going to go to China. It's going to be exciting for Chinese audiences, a Chinese guy in the MCU. Uh, but I just I wanted to hear more. I feel like if we kept returning to the representation argument over and over again. I feel like that will contribute to its success. But I felt like Dan had so many good arguments for why Doctor Strange Two is going to be a huge success and resonate with audiences. I got to go with it. Uh, okay, that's one for. Dan, um, I saw it a little bit differently. Um, I agree with you on Spencer. Uh, you know, um, you uh, had uh, some good uh, general thoughts about the film, but there weren't enough specifics as to why it would pop. So, uh, yeah, I got to uh, uh, put you in third place in this mm. argument right here. Uh, so between. Dan and Mark, I thought Dan had a lot of uh, strong specifics about why it might be a good film and why I want to see it. Like, I'm interested in seeing the multiverse and Scarlet Witch and how she's going to factor in and a time heist. But the most powerful argument came from Mark uh, in regards to the international box office, the representation on screen. And uh, Dan, I, and I, I uh, feel like it just uh, didn't quite hold water saying that um, the the a Marvel character who was Chinese being big in China, that is going to be huge. I was actually in Japan when um, Avengers Endgame came out, and it was insanity. And for a Marvel film to have a Chinese lead um, opening in Asia, I mean, it's going to do gangbusters business. And the, the seeing... Uh, and the representation, like in Black Panther and uh, Crazy Rich Asians, and like seeing yourself on screen is a huge deal. So I think that could overwhelm uh, the box office f in favor of Shang Chi. So it's one one. Let's go to Danielle Radford. Yeah, it's me. Um, so I just felt like Spencer got crowded out, and it wound up being a lot of them kind of going back and forth with each other. Um, this is a tough one because the, these were both fantastic arguments. Um, the Representation argument is huge. Lord knows Black Panther got all of our black dollars. Um, and we were happy to give it to them several times. But this is one thing where I, I, you make a fatal mistake when you bring a box office fight to Dan. I think that winds up not necessarily always working in your favor. So while I do think that that was a fantastic argument, um, because Dan had more arguments than, because I felt like that was kind of the one that yours hinged on, he was also able to counter that with genuine like knowledge and facts because box office is kind of his thing. Um, so I gotta give that to Dan. Boom, Mark, you just got charted. <laughs> I took the box <laughs> office. Out. Crazy Rich Asians did not do well in China. They, they, a lot of the Chinese audience found it to be very laughable, a very laughable depiction. Of <laughs> because it wasn't in the MCU. Yeah, no. <laughs> if Crazy Rich Asians somehow can get woven into the fabric of the Marvel Cinematic Universe now, sky's the limit for that sequel. Ooh, yeah. I mean, we're uh, <laughs> looking at a crossover there. So, uh, going to question four, uh, it is Dan 2. Spencer won. Mark? Got got one. Mm. No, looking to get on the board. We don't have a scoreboard right in front of us, so oh, I okay. assumed I had a point oh, somewhere. No, there's a scoreboard right there. I wanted to know. Yeah, there's a scoreboard right, right on the screen there. All right, question number... <laughs> I think it says I have eight, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, question number four. Uh, so uh, we ask, which streaming service is the least likely to exceed? Which streaming service least likely to succeed? And come around. Mark, start us off. <laughs> Hal, um, look, you, you might have seen my previous arguments today, and you said, well, Mark, you're just, you're just throwing stuff against the wall. You don't really feel that way about Spider-Man Far From Home. You know nothing about Shang-Chi. Wait until you see this argument, because I have evidence. On my cellular telephone, uh -oh. I have multiple emails from a service called Fubo TV. That sounds cool. Now, what Fubo TV yeah, is, 
is they claim that they will bring you live sports as they're happening. And so three beers deep, Mark Ellis, last Thanksgiving, decided, I'm going to sign up for this Fubo TV, and I'm going to watch me the uh, Washington-Dallas game. And I'm going to impress the whole family by hooking it up, because for some godforsaken reason, my brother who lives in Seattle, which could get a direct TV dish, does not have cable. So I hook up Fubo TV and I sign up for it. How? I cannot get out of this goddamn contract to save my life. I keep getting emails about who I need to call and who I should go. If anybody knows how to, I just want to cancel Fubo TV. They've ruined my credit. I can't get an apartment in this town anymore. I'm sleeping in the back of the Laugh Factory because Fubo TV has robbed me not only of my soul, it has robbed my eyeballs of anything good to watch, and it has robbed my bank account of all credibility when it comes to Mr. Taxman. I've not paid my taxes in a year because of Fubo TV. <laughs> now, the other thing Fubo TV doesn't have is uh, any of the good shows that you're going to hear from Spencer or Dan's streaming service. Fubo TV, they don't have uh, any of the, they don't have the Mandalorian. Fubo TV is not going to have uh, Netflix comedy specials. Fubo TV is not going to have Star Trek into Discovery. They're not going to have uh, the other Star Trek show, Darkness Falls. They're not going to have the... Picard. They're not going to have Picard. Are you kidding? Me? Fubo TV? They have literally I can't nothing. see card on Fubo? Fubo TV is the eternals of the streaming service world in the sense that we don't know Break what the me. hell it is. And I can't it, watch Dave Chappelle's Sticks and Stones on Fubo? You can see absolutely nothing on Fubo TV. Wait, wait did you see the football game? Yeah. No! It was a 10 minute delay, and so I had to log into my well, NFL you Direct TV but account. You still got but you still saw the game. For. I still got to see on 10 minutes. Of, have you ever tried to watch a live sport 10 minutes after the fact? It is atrocious. How You may as well not be watching sports at all. You may as well go back to knitting or playing with your dolls in your bathtub. Whatever you grown people do if you're not watching athletics. Mark Ellis got <laughs> burned by Fubo. All right, Spencer. Uh, if I recall, I picked... Is it Apple Plus? Yes. Yeah, Apple Plus. Man, that thing's going to be a, 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 a year and then... Um, Apple Plus, uh, uh, Apple TV Plus, is the luxury boutique uh, uh, premium subscription service from Apple with all sorts of shows from all sorts of people that you've never seen and never will uh, because Apple is going to get bored with this and cancel it in a year. Um, there is no library on which to build on. And as we found, as Netflix is discovering to its dismay, People go on streaming services to watch Friends and The Office, and they have no friends and they have no office of which to speak of. Uh, this is all banking on launching all these original properties from all these uh, uh, people. It's not very clear how many episodes, what it's going to be. Um, it's expensive. You don't know how much content there's going to be at the end. I watched that whole presentation of like Jason Momoa. Love the guy, but he's like, it's a show. Get ready. This is there's going to be no hype. And then, furthermore, on top of that, uh, Apple is what a, a almost a trillion dollar company. Uh, uh, this is not their bread and butter. They do not make their money this way. They have no skin in the game, so to speak. There's no reason for them to try to make this work. Unlike a Disney or a Netflix, who needs this to succeed? They'll try it just to throw their hat in the ring, see that it's not making money, and cancel it. Thank you, Spencer. Dan, what do you got? I am going with. NBC Universal Max, whatever uh, plus, uh, whatever the eventual streaming service. That NBC sounds Universal. like a fact check for Lon. Uh, they are trying to position themselves as being in the game with the uh, Hulu, with the, the the Warner Maxes and the Disney Pluses of the world, and this is what they have proposed thus far. Yes, uh, paying hundreds of millions of dollars for exclusive rights to a show, The Office, that you can buy. On Amazon, as wa and watch as much as you want for less than it costs to subscribe to a year of their service. And oh, by the way, it will probably have commercial breaks in it. So they're literally pitching the old way that people hated watching television so much that they abandoned it the second that TiVo came by. So you're starting at negative hundreds of millions of dollars for a show that anyone can just buy and watch at their own convenience, commercial free, anytime that they want. Uh, and that's literally. Their only plan right now. They're staking everything on one show that well, you can get almost anywhere else for cheaper I, without eyes, commercials. You just I feel like we're not even having an argument like on a show. Uh -huh. I feel like Dan cornered Spencer and I into <laughs> his office. Have you heard about I, this NBC? That's how I'm moving, <laughs> baby. Is, uh, is it 
Do they all? Will they also have friends? Yeah, or they might that... as well call this trapped at a table with Dan. Yes, they also. They, they may also buy friends for hundreds of millions. Oh no, Lon well, says, says no. Is, oh, that's no? the HBO Warner. Oh, HBO. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. So that's right. So but they, we could let him go down the rabbit hole. So, uh, so hundreds of millions of dollars for a show that you can buy other uh, in other places, potentially probably without commercials, and that's it so far. Apple Plus. At least has number one a lot of talent attached to make shows. You got J.J. Abrams, you got Steven Spielberg. Yes, they're unknown quantities, but they could be fantastic. And number two, it's got Apple in the name. Have you seen Apple fran fans? I could take a shit in a box and call it I dump, and there would be a line outside the Apple store to Not buy anymore, it. Not anymore, man. Oh yeah, the, the the glitz and the glam is gone. That's All why right, let's, let's open this up. There's a hardcore base of people that will buy anything that says Apple blank in front of it or I blank in it's front of it. It's shrinking, but the I dump is an underrated product. I just so, want to be at the Genius Bar, uh, so, you, so your I dump doesn't work. Okay, uh, we're gonna need some burritos, and uh, you need to leave me your I dump pocket uh, for about an hour. <laughs> Fubo to me sounds like the perfect product. They don't have to pay to make anything, and once you sign up for it you, you can't, can't leave I still I've paid Look. for CBS All Access for three years because I can't be bothered to click two buttons on my remote yep. to unsubscribe from it I sign up for the free <laughs> trial every year to watch the Super Bowl but yeah, the, they may be the, the last one standing the things that work on streaming are library content stuff that exists stuff that people can just marathon that they know will always be there for them which NBC even if they don't have uh, friends they have so many shows from their history if they can pull 30 Rock if they can get uh, uh, Frasier or Seinfeld they can also pull, it'd be a dick move, but if they really want this to work, they could pull it from Amazon. No, you can't buy uh, Friends off Amazon. The only place you can get it now is on NBC, com, whatever, Universal Plus. Uh, Fubo, the other thing people still watch TV for is sports. I'm told. People watch sports and, it's great. and you have to pay to watch it. There's no free way of getting sports and it sounds like once you're in, you can't get out. Sport, yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a necessity for the first time. that you pay for and can't get out of. Like That, that may not be a good business practice, but they're going to be successful. Look, Hal, here's the thing, okay? I'm going to yeah. give you what, what Spencer said about Dan's thing and what Dan said about Spencer's thing. I'm going to give you that again just after the fact. A lot like what Fubo TV does for sports <laughs> is that after the event is done or when you already know what happened, when you already got the update, the Ten one minutes? thing I'm listening to arguments about how to watch live sports from people who do not watch a lot of live sports. I watch live sports. Then, the because you didn't give me that argument. Spencer did. So Spencer <laughs> basically is saying, well, they give you sports. You do it, Sports, 10 minutes after it happened, is literally literally worthless. It does not matter why? at all. They already have that and you can just watch Sports Center after the fact. I can't no tell you why. I can't I can't tell you why in my soul and every sports fan. Oh, oh. Okay, look. Let me let me uh, okay, show. That makes let sense. me tell you about a couple emails. That's a whole other issue. <laughs> you can okay. make so much money off conning your friends to show them the Fubo yes. feed and then bet so, no, you can have a side hustle be on Twitter. where you don't tell your friends that Fubo is 10 minutes behind and you sneak in your phone and you're like I'll bet you 10 bucks I that they make this Fubo fun. email. The first Fubo email, welcome to the team. Get started. There's 70 channels, including Discovery, Nick Jr., and Nickelodeon. Okay. That's their lead sled dog, Hal. Nick Jr. Lead, Nick no Jr. leading the right. charge. Wait, you want to be, are you trying to get me arrested? If you get Fubo TV, you get to go door to door to so your neighbor's houses sports. whenever you're you just move. Telling, telling me it's a better deal. And then I got another email from Fubo. Your account needs attention. I just <laughs> wanted to end, Fubo. Now, look, Hal, to be, to be fair here, Apple and NBC, they both have a lot of money money to put into a streaming service. The only money that Fubo has is mine, and I want it back. <laughs> wow, all right. But they can't, but they can't yeah. get it, you can't, they Nobody's can't Nobody's heard them. of Fubo. It's if, if you're uh, Mark, let's make this your final thoughts. Go ahead, and is there anything else you want to add? I would like to add a lot of things. But I'll close with this. <laughs> yes. Is that the bottom line is that nobody's ever heard of Fubo TV. And the question is, what is the least likely to succeed? It's going to be a streaming service that nobody's ever heard of. Nobody knows what Fubo TV is. Everybody knows Apple. Everybody knows NBC. NBC has a lot of built in brands. Like we love our office, we love other things that NBC can produce. And Apple has a lot of original content that they've announced with big name stars and directors. Fubo TV has none of that. It just has sports that is done. At, it, the sport has ended, and then you get to watch it on Fubo. What a bargain. Give me my money back. Wow, sounds more like Fubar TV, Mark. Am I right? All right, Spencer. I don't know. Uh, spending uh, like a cheaper cable package that just gives you all the sports channels sounds like a pretty good deal, and I'm glad, you're I'm glad you're giving them the free press, because now Fubo TV will get that boost. And, uh, and I hadn't heard around. of it before. <laughs> Nobody had. I gave them my Gmail. Usually I just give a streaming service my Hotmail. I gave them my so Gmail. So clearly it was a good enough proposition that you signed 
signed up and paid real hard-earned money for. Apple Snake ha- Oil. Apple just you know, it's not just the money, it's the will. They have no will. They do, <laughs> they do not want to get an original content. They have no uh, no spine. They uh, they can't uh, they're not there to stick it out. They are a company that is designed to sell the next iPhone and the next i whatever, uh, the next iPod. They do not know what they're doing. They're just throwing a little cash this way and seeing what happens. That is not the makings of a long-term business. Thank you, Spencer. Dan. Uh, Apple is one of the ones that's putting their money where their mouth is. I would say they have no spine. They're they're attracting more top level talent collectively than any of the other streaming service. I think that's worth something. I think the reason that everyone's down on them right now a little bit is that we haven't really seen any of what they're making. And I understand that it's the great unknown, uh, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of potential. Plus, Apple has something that nobody else has, which is the ability to send their programming directly to their consumers on the devices that they're spending hours a day on already. They're iPhones. Yeah, when they gave everyone U2, we all loved it. Everybody, (laughs) they gave it to them for free, and one U2 U2 album versus being able to start a new episode (laughs) and have a a base of millions of people that you can send that episode to and say, you can watch this for free. That's an advantage that no other service has, and that Apple does have. Uh, Whereas NBC Universal uh, is part of a dinosaur, uh, of a dying cable dynasty. Uh, Nobody uh, wants to give uh, the old guard their money as far as like oh Comcast NBC aren't they the Comcast people I like I just I just I just quit I just I just left them behind I'm not I'm just gonna buy the office for 80 bucks on Amazon with no commercials and watch it there there's an easy alternative to NBC Universal streaming service thus far uh, why bother why bother to, to, to make that big of a spend for something that may not even work out with The Office? I don't understand it. There's better ways to watch the one thing they're building their entire platform around. It is a one-trick pony. It's going to fail. Fubo, uh, I hear about a new thing that's been around for like 15 years. So like, oh, you never heard of Smish Smash? It's been around for 12 years. These little ones are the ones that are going to be around at the end. Fubo is no Smish Smash. Fubo, <laughs> it's going to be, I, would, I wouldn't be shocked if at the end all of the companies that put <laughs> hundreds of billions of dollars fold and Fubo is there to pick up the no! pieces. Because it's so low stakes, <laughs> they survived. I'm just uh, one guy, Fubo. Time. All right. Uh, Lon, what do we got in the fact zone? Uh, Fubo TV says it has over 250,000 users to date. I Ooh. feel like 100 of them are intentionally on Fubo, and the rest are just can't get out of yeah. their uh, Movie their Pass is still in business. Look, yeah. it's all it's a drink at Thanksgiving they is do, the rule. They do, in fairness, pull in content from some pretty big channels, AMC, FX, Bravo, Fox News, TBS, USA, Network, Sci-Fi, Sunday TV, great. MTV, IFC, all have content on Fubo. Uh, only other uh, fact that I found, the Seinfeld streaming rights will become available in 2021. They're expected to set off a pretty big bidding war. Netflix says they want it and are prepared to spend half a billion dollars. You know who else wants it? Fubo TV. <laughs> you know, you want Seinfeld? You gotta go so to Fubo. So certainly a possibility for Comcast to pick up for NBC. You could also go to Netflix or anywhere else. Who knows? Comcast does say they're planning to spend a lot of money to license shows for this NBCU service. Mm. Gotcha. Thank you, Lon. Uh, Danielle, please chime in with your thoughts on this question. Oh, man. This is... Um so all of these sound terrible. You did a great <laughs> job of making me not want to spend money with any of these services. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. Um, the Apple Plus one got dinged, uh, which with the arguments about all the creators that they're bringing in, um, and the fact that he doesn't really need it to work. So that one was taken out for me. So it was between NBC Universal and, Fu- and Fubo TV. And I've got to, you know, I get Mark up on, the, or let's almost get him up on the board because for this one specifically, um, because, you know, people will just go, because you had the argument that, you know, people are just going to watch, you know, the things that they already watch. And I think that Spencer did a great job of saying, like, yeah, like, that's why people were watching things on Netflix. I feel like with Fubo, um, weirdly, I didn't feel like that got hammered <laughs> enough. Um, so I'm going to go with Mark on this one. Uh, that's uh, one for Mark. Lon? Oh, uh, I thought I thought you were going to go with you. I wasn't prepared. Uh, oh, uh, you know, I, I can take it. No, I'm fine. Okay. Either, either, it's up Look, to you. Yeah. We, we both know. You want to say Fubo? (laughs) You host the show. I'll I'll follow your lead. Oh, (laughs) it's like two people said a stop sign. No, you go. Um, (laughs) No, you. you. So uh, you know what? Um, it, it, it was it was damn close, but I got the I I, I just got the, uh, the, the the impression that 
Fubo uh, would be the, like kind of the little engine that could of of these of these net like and they make it so hard to get out of their contract. It's throwing all so, of my coal so, into so, that engine. So, yeah, so uh, p- people are gonna enter uh, coupon code movie fights for a twenty percent discount. Yeah, so, so, so people are, are are gonna be locked in, not not able to get out. Uh, S- S- Spencer, I thought you put a, a lot of your argument into um, like, oh, you know, Apple's gonna try it and then they'll get bored with it. Like we don't know that. that and there are some uh, strong creators. I, th- I thought Dan uh, had the best argument as far as the lack of content, and then go- oh, sending my money back to Comcast. Comcast after I thought I cut the cord. Uh, so yeah, I thought the most compelling argument, the most passion came from Mark, but the most compelling argument uh, mm-hmm. came from Dan for me. So it's one one. Lon, who do you got? Yeah, it also came down to Mark versus Dan for me on this one. I, I just thought like you know Apple, you, you, you may be right that they're not gonna really try that hard, but they have so much money to throw around. I feel like Apple might luck out and stick around for a few years just based on if they get one or two shows that connect yeah, with people. Yeah, a few years. Well, but, you know, that, that might be enough time for Fubo to go under. So it, really, it really came down to, to Fubo. I thought, and I thought both of these were actually really good arguments. Mark came at it from the, it's not a well-run company, it's disorganized, it's chaotic, it, things, things don't work the way you want them to. But I felt like ultimately I thought Dan had the strongest case where it was, they're just, there's not only do they not have the content ready to go, but they don't really have any way to get the content and that it's going to be with ads, which is what people left the old cable version to get away from. I'm going with Dan. All right, Dan, you take the point and you move into a 3-1 lead. Also, I have to mention this because I just looked it up. Yes. Fubo is $55 a month? What are you doing? What? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> that is Could have brought that up. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 wow, it's, bury the lead, why don't you? Jiminy Crickets. Look, I am swimming in debt. My wife left me. My kids don't even want to talk to me because daddy can't give them a good Christmas. Who got yanked out of private school last Man, semester? Listen, My children. Haven't they I, watched I, some live sports? Yeah. <laughs> Only a small I play. hope you get some of the dirty channels for all that cash. All right. Five so. Dollars. Oh, my God, you guys. It's from Blind Fight. Oh. All right, here it is. Hobbs and Shaw came out. (laughs) True story. (laughs) So we ask you, we're going to ask you to... uh, Fact check, no it did. Oh, what? (laughs) Uh, We're going to ask you to pick two names out of this hat and pitch their team-up movie. Mm. And uh, you'll pick random names and uh, that we will... uh, uh, and we'll, uh, th- that we secretly put in this hat before the show. All right, go ahead and pick two. All right. And start thinking about your team up immediately. Got one. And got the All right, other. Good. Okay. Spenny. Danny. One and two. Right. All I'm right, gonna Spencer, you're going to be going first, so... Uh, Think for a moment, and uh, I want you to just, uh, first, let's hear uh, who you got, Spencer. (laughs) All right, I got uh, Will Smith's character, Mike Lowry from Bad Boys, uh, paired with Bruce Willis as himself. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) great. Uh, uh, A bad boy and a bad man. (laughs) Uh, Great. Uh, 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 Dan, who do you got? Dan? I got Dina from Girls Trip, which is Tiffany Haddish's character, and Bo Peep from... Toy Story Sure. Four. Okay. Okay. That's going to be a comic Solid. misadventure. Yeah. And uh, Mark Ellis. I got uh, Saw Guerrero from Rogue One. Sure. And uh, Derek Zoolander. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Great. Uh, Spencer, why don't you um, um, so launch into that pitch? Everyone's real worried about the Die Hard prequel, right? McLean? Is that what it's going to be called? John McLean? This is either that movie or a meta film to come out before that movie. So the studio's worried about the Die Hard prequel. They can tell that Bruce Willis has been phoning it in for about seven films now. And they are, in an attempt to uh, reignite his interest in police work, they're having him shadow the hottest funnest, most engaged detective uh, uh, cop in this in Miami, Mike Lowry from Bad Boys. <laughs> so it is a ride-along situation where Bruce Willis is a jaded actor who thinks he knows it all and is over, uh, over it and doesn't even care about this movie. He's just doing it for a paycheck. Uh, he is paired with the, uh, the woo man himself, uh, Will Smith, and they actually go on a drug bust, uh, you know, a Miami, they uncover a Miami Beach cocaine dealer that goes all the way back to the movie studio that sent him there. Whoa! 
Oh, oh my God! And Bruce Willis is finally engaged. <clears throat> he finally falls back in love with acting, back in love with police work, and he makes a great prequel to Die Hard at the end. <laughs> All right, uh, that was great. Except I thought the Woo Man was Ric Flair. You know, it's a. They, they show I, the I digress. Belt. It's okay. a Wu Tang Clan. Th thank you, <laughs> uh, Dan. Oh man. <laughs> Girls Trip, we all remember. Oh yeah, great film. Good Zip time. Line and a lot of fun. Peeing on the crowd. Yeah. Underneath <laughs> Tiffany Haddish, uh, I believe, uh, as uh, as deserving of an Oscar nomination for that film as Melissa McCarthy was for uh, Bridesmaids. Seconded. Uh, I think that was uh, uh, my, by far my favorite performance of hers, a breakout performance. So we bring her back for the sequel, but it's an all new ladies trip, and who better <laughs> who better to join the gang? Then Bo Peep. We, Bo Peep has found herself. <laughs> Bo Peep has found herself as of late, as we saw in Toy Story 4. She's found her independence. Uh, she's she's going to leave Woody at the carnival, and she's she's hitting the road, baby, <laughs> with uh, Dina from Girls Trip and the gang, all the rest of them. And, <laughs> and Nick Mundy, and Nick Mundy oh. whose, whose okay, cameo was cut from the first film, oh, will be yeah. in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Bring him back. Movie in this movie, uh, <laughs> redemption for Nick uh, and girls, and it's just gonna be a, it's just gonna be a fun it's just gonna be a fun girls trip, but with a lamp. <laughs> All right, uh, a gir girls trip too with Bo Peep and uh, Tiff Haddish. Uh, Mark, uh, pitch us, my man. How like my chances of winning today? My chair is sinking. <laughs> you know, it's to oh me. no, the sinking chair. chair. Yeah. Yeah. Insult to injury. Let me, let me try to get it. You know what? Here, I, I can just do this. All right, look, this is going to be a we buried you rolling comedy <laughs> we you. in the vein of a Forty-Eight Hours Beverly Hills Cop, where you have a mismatched pair, and that again, Saw Gerrera from Rogue One. Is he he represents when you see him in the movie a guy who has just been through the worst that a person can go through. He he's got that far away stare in his eyes, that ten mile distance. He's so jaded. He's got all of the distaste of modern society that a war veteran might. And the reason why he has that because he signed up for Fubo TV. And so oh, no. Saul Guerrero. Oh, <laughs> has to go to find the headquarters of Fubo TV, which is very tough, and he finally tracks them down in the country of Luxembourg is where Fubo TV's headquarters are. And when he gets there, who does he run into but beleaguered down on his luck model Derek Zoolander, Whoa. who can only get some hand modeling work in the country of Luxembourg. And once Derek tells him that he had a contract with Fubo TV for some foot modeling that went awry, Saw teams up with Derek, and maybe they just give enough zany looks and enough <laughs> gritty, gutty laser blasters to get inside the headquarters of Fubo TV and rescue Saw Gerrera's bank account once and for all. All right, y'all want to poke some holes? Listen, uh, they both pitch the same dynamic we've seen a million times. A, a grumpy, do, grumpy, gruff dude and like charismatic other guy. Like that's It works for a reason. Movie ever made. But yeah, I want, you know what I've never seen? A road trip comedy with a lamp. Never seen it in my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Seen it. No, you're right. That, I haven't seen that. Is what, an uh, accurate a statement. Lamp. It, plus, we get Andy Potts more work, which is always a good thing. Anything that gets Andy Potts more work. Now, is this animated mix? No, uh, it's, it's like it? Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Oh, okay. it's like Who Framed Roger Rabbit. <laughs> so you have live action Tiffany Haddish, uh, CG uh, Bo Peep from Toy Story Four. Uh -huh. uh, not the size of Tiffany Haddish. Lamp size. <laughs> Sure. That's because uh, just imagine the the visuals of her buckled into the front seat of the car, this tiny little porcelain lamp. All right, that's cute. Riffing that's it up, cute. Riffing it up with Tiffany but Haddish like, on the road. You're taking away her greatest strength, which is riffing it up. I don't think you can do improv with an animated character because it takes like she, years of rendering, and you need to pre-write, and she needs to be looking in the right place. You can't let Tiff riff. Did you no? Did you see John Favreau? He made Lion King with like in real time with like virtual reality goggles. James Cameron is directing this, so the technological. <laughs> wow, you got oh, the hey, hey. There's no hey. limit to the technological wow. <laughs> innovation of this. Yeah, this is going to be his follow-up to Avatar 2. He's, he's scrapping the rest, and he's making Tiffany Haddish and Bo Peep <laughs> because he wants to be the first director to make a lamp uh, uh, mixture. He wants to be the first director to make a mixture of live-action uh, CGI lamp road trip Comedy. Well, that I'm getting the first. He's a, he's a, he's Who's directing? Directing? I'm getting, Who's directing? I'm Lord and Miller to write and direct. Uh, they can do meta with 21 Jump Street real well. And I just love the character dynamics. Uh, uh, not just like, oh, one's jaded and one is uh, is still like too in love with his job. Because that's 
uh, that's given a fresh coat of paint because that's the truth of Bruce Willis and Will Smith. Will Smith still cares. Will Smith still shows up and gives 110%, and Bruce Willis has abandoned acting for, you know, the veil of tears for, since 1992. <laughs> Mark, he, who's directing yours? Uh, well, it was going to be uh, Lord and Miller, and they're available to do Spencer's project because we brought in Ron Howard to replace them because <laughs> they were going way too off the blank check on this one. With Derek <laughs> and the charm of my movie, Hal, is that these guys don't belong together, and they're in such a preposterously funny situation. They'll also lead to some real-life lessons where I feel like Bruce Willis, well past his prime, people don't want to see Will Smith team with Bruce Willis. They're excited about Bad Boys for Life for a reason, because it's him back with Martin Lawrence. They don't want to see Will Smith team up with Bruce Willis, and with Dan's movie, I think that that's not for either audience, because I don't think that parents want their kids to go see Bo Peep in a movie with sort of a foul-mouthed comedian, and I don't think that Tiffany Haddish fans want to see Tiffany Haddish's comedy watered down. Time! I think we heard more more than enough. <laughs> All right. Woo. Great pitches. Great pitches from everybody. No, not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? Uh, Dan, you came in hard with those with, with that, that imagery at the end. It was James Cameron, uh, the live action. <laughs> that almost took it for me. But um, at the end of the day, someone just had an unbeatable pitch right out of the gate. And to me, it was Spencer with the real Bruce Willis going in with the fictional cop <laughs> with this meta relationship based on it. the gruff Willis demeanor, him trying to get uh, in the zone for the McLean movie uh, with the bad boys, and then the drug plot goes back to the studio. See, I just recited the whole thing because I love it. Thank I'm bankrolling it. It's greenlit. <laughs> Go picture. Um, you, uh, you're greenlit for me, Spencer. That's one for Spencer. Uh, Lon, who do you got? Uh, well, I've got a couple facts. Uh, Don, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, prequel. Yeah. It is called McLean. Well done. Fubo TV headquartered in New York, but I love the setting of Luxembourg so much. I say we ignore it. <laughs> they that. want you to think it's yes. in New York. Uh, and then finally, I, <laughs> and, and I'm throwing this out to the group. Yeah. Does the file of Galadriel from Lord of the Rings count as a lamp being brought on a road trip? It lights up. That was the light oh. of a star. Oh. That was the light of a star. That was not a lamp. That was, that was the, the light. That was thank you. Ethereal. Thank you, comic book man. There's <laughs> not, not a limp <laughs> any more <laughs> than like Ursula Minor is a limp. Uh, all right, so uh, um, who, uh, who do you... Uh, to, to move yeah. on, I mean, I, I really did think everybody made some, some really exciting, fun pitches out of yes. not a lot to go on. I do agree that Dan's felt to me the, the thinnest. It just basically felt like the first movie, but also there's this lamp. So You're unfortunately, exactly he, right. he got he got eliminated. He got three points. He, he got yeah. eliminated right off the bat, so it really came down to Spencer versus Mark. And I, I have to say, I thought as, as, as brilliant as Spencer's original content, like when he first pitched that, I was like, that sounds like a movie. He's going to win. But Mark just kept adding little tidbits and details that appealed to me. And I mm -hmm. do think the, the craziness of the scenario of these two guys bringing down Fubo TV, <laughs> I'm one over. I'm going with Mark. Mm -hmm. All right. And I'm you're perfect. getting ish international dollars from Luxembourg because yeah, they finally I mean, get to see it. It's a tiny country. country. It checks all the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I I is there a mom in it? Yeah, and I'm sure there white moms in Luxembourg. <laughs> I believe so. The European <laughs> country. Uh, okay, so it's one one. Uh, Danielle, um, make some sense of this, please. I, how could I? Uh, um, true, an impossible task. I, I couldn't even. Uh, Dan, man, just a valiant effort. I have to make sure that I say that. You still no. I don't think it was. <laughs> you're, you're <laughs> impossible. Um, so again, it was between um, Mark and Spenny for me. And while um, Spencer's is the one that actually does sound like a movie that could be made, I did like the how Mark continued to add on and add on and add on, so I'm going with Mark. Ah, Boom, yeah. Ellis on the board. That ah. means we are all tied up to see who's gonna go into the speed round. Here is the tiebreaker. The tiebreaker uh, between Spencer and Mark works thusly. I will ask the question, um, shout out your answers, then you have 20 seconds uh, to uh, elaborate on your answer, and then we'll get 10 second rebuttals after that in the order that you answer. Mark, may the best man enjoy Live sports at fifty-five dollars a month, with no cancellation policy. Nick Jr. Right. Lifetime Discovery Channel. Uh, I think you were catfish. <laughs> And to clarify, we're going to vote for who we do want to move on or who we don't. Uh, do let's vote on. for who we do want to move on. Who we do uh, want? Because there's only two. Yeah. There's only two. Catfish. Uh, 
All right. Uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, as as usual, I only read what's in front of me. There is no tie break question in front of me, so I am going to make one up right now. It's a blind question. Yes. All right. Guess I'll be fact checking. Here it is. Best Sylvester Stallone movie. Rocky Four. Oh, great. Rocky Four and Rocky. Rocky. Yeah. All right. Right. We have Rocky Four. I heard Rocky Four first, and then uh, yeah. Rocky. So, uh, Mark, uh, you will go first. You have 20 seconds on the clock. Um, Spencer, you will go second. Rocky Four has everything you want. It's a great film. Nay, documentary. Rocky Four literally ended the Cold War, and it was the precursor to the Berlin Wall falling because it taught us that communism is not the answer. What is the answer? Getting in the ring one more time, defending your best friend who was falling at the hands of the evil Ivan Drago. And you know what? Maybe even Ivan Drago. Drago learned a little something because if I can change and you can change, everybody can change. Rocky IV didn't end the Cold War. The Cold War ended the Cold War. The USSR, is, it was built on a house of sand. That's a different story. Rocky is a Best Picture winner. Uh, this is a, a true personal story from Sylvester Stallone, the greatest performance he's ever given and probably ever will because it was so intensely personal and is the ultimate underdog story. There is a reason why Ro uh, Rocky is, is the analogy that gets thrown around to every other underdog. Time, time. Rocky won a lot of awards, but it does not mean that it stands the test of time like Rocky Ford does. Rocky Ford airs endlessly more than Rocky. Rocky takes 38 commercial breaks before it gets interesting. Rocky Four interesting right out of the gate. Everything you love about Rocky Four is just a heightened version of what's in Rocky, and playing it more realistic, playing it as a, as a hard scrabble Philadelphia story works the first time. It doesn't work as well the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth time. This. Time! Okay, uh, so, uh, you know what, you would have thought the Academy Award would have taken it, but he dinged you, you didn't really ding him, and uh, he painted the more compelling picture of the movie. So, mm. while my brain says Spencer, mm. Based on the information, I'm going Mark! Danielle. Um, I've got to go the opposite. Both really great arguments, but I thought that, um, as, as particularly the, that last bit when you mentioned that it works well the first time, but it doesn't continue to work afterwards, I thought that that was a great um, a great counter, so I'm going with Spencer. All right, 1-1, one, one. Lon. Yeah, I'm going with Spencer as well. I think the, the point oh, about Rocky Four is, <laughs> is taking the format of Rocky's or redoing it, amping it up. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm going with Spencer like, as well. Did you bet right. against yourself oh, to pay God. for Boo <laughs> Yeah, Mark uh, picked this. They're watching it on a 10 minute delay somewhere. Yeah. That's literally the plot of the stage, by the way. Yeah. Is the, the, the delay on horse yep. racing, and then they place the bet on a horse. See? You're this part is... of a sting. Yeah. I'm yeah. glad. If I could have won one debate here today, I'm glad that it was Hogarera and Derek Zoolander <laughs> taking down Fubo, because if I could vote for two people to take down Fubo, it's going to be those gentlemen. All right, Fubo, your, 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 your headquarters is burning as we speak. Uh, Mark, New well York. fought, my friend. Friend, yeah, you guys uh, still validate, right? <laughs> no, um, money's yes, to type for that. Yes, we do. Do I get to vote for the, for them though, uh, or do I just hang out? Um, you know what? Uh, we'll we'll uh, bring you into the fun. Yeah, you can okay. give yeah. my vote. It, you, yeah. you sounded like that's not something you normally do, but it, you it, feel it isn't, so bad it, for it, me. It, it, no, it, it, it's <laughs> not. No, because but you're such an esteemed guest, of course. Uh, carte you. blanche, uh, okay. Mark. Yeah, you can All have right. my vote. You can have Lon's vote. Um, <laughs> Bye. I don't need it. I'm not using it. Speed round. Here we go. So uh, uh, Spencer <laughs> Spencer won the tie break, uh, but that did not count for a point. So oh, we cool. enter at three one. Mm. Um, it is game point. Is uh, it? No. Oh, I, I oh, oh with the five questions. Gotcha. Five, yeah. Yeah, okay, five. so it's to five, yes? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, now, from now on, it's, yeah, I've got to mathematically eliminate him. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm. So it's it's three to one, first player to five. Correct. Yes. Here we go. Three, one, Dan, first player to five. Uh, here is the question. Same rules as the tie break. I'll ask the question, shout out your answer, then the uh, 20 seconds, 20 seconds, then 10 second rebuttals. Stuber was great, huh? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, I didn't mean to uh, intimate that that was the question. Uh, so we ask, what comedian wrestler duo should do an action movie next? Comedian wrestler? Okay. Comedian slash comedian, rest, comedian and wrestler. And a wrestler or what a comedian duo? Wrestler? What comedian wrestler a comedian? duo? I think oh, the okay. word Go duo. Wrestler. I think the word duo clarifies. Yeah, you're right. You're yeah. right. You're right. <laughs> Joe Star wrote this one, but you pick a comedian. Of course, you're right. Yeah. The two. Th he, he wrote about comedy and wrestling. How could I not have <laughs> Joe Star wrote that? You know what? I'll call an audible. You can um, pick an MMA guy if you want. Oh. Yeah. Oh. 
Yeah, you wish you had that Fubo subscription now, don't you? So wrestler or MMA guy? <laughs> Damn it. Do we just keep expanding it? Okay. Right. Okay, I'm going to add boxers. Okay, okay, okay. okay, okay. <laughs> No, it's the comedian Hulk. part that's throwing me, but yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Hulk Hogan and Dave Chappelle. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's a devastating a combo. In that yeah. Car. Okay, fine. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of playing fast and loose with the definition of comedian. I'm doing uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin and Kevin Sorbo. <laughs> comedian? Wait, who's, well, who's what? <laughs> yeah. Fine. Kevin Sorbo. Right, Kevin Hart. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, Stone Cold and Kevin Hart. There we go. We heard Dan first. 20 seconds begin when you speak. Uh, yeah, I want to see these two paired up just to see them argue about like what things they are and aren't allowed to say, uh, who they mutually hate and don't hate. Um, where do they overlap? Just think of the fascination um, the, where their biases intersect, where their hatred of like the media dif differs and doesn't, their, where their thoughts on just like society. Like, oh my God. That sounds like an extremely uncomfortable experience. Um, I know that uh, uh, Kevin Hart, despite what he does outside of his uh, films, keeps things light, keeps things fun and fresh. And Stone Cold is like the gruff, uh, uh, you know, uh, old cantankerous man. And uh, and he's really good with uh, Kevin Hart's great physical comedy. I want to see Kevin Hart get Stone Cold stunned. I believe that's a wrestling move, so I win. <laughs> <laughs> We've done the funny guy teams up with the wrestler thing before. That's the whole wrestling formula. It's tiled. Cinema is uncomfortable sometimes, and I want to see this moment in history through these two people. It's going to be a train wreck, but what a glorious train wreck. Cinema can be uncomfortable, but you don't want your comedy to be uncomfortable. You want to be laughing, not cringing, um, and I think that Kevin Hart will at least give you a few uh, uh, big laughs, big voices, big physical action comedy beats, and Stone Cold can keep up. Time. All right. Good work, fellas. Um, you know what? Uh, we're going to give the first uh, vote here to uh, Mark. Tell us what you thought. The kids tables up. I don't want an official vote. I just, I'll give, oh, my, no, I'll I'm, give my quick take Listen, here. Listen, this, um, this, this there is no problem with you having a look, vote on this ridiculous dog and pony show. <laughs> I would see, I would go see either movie. Um, I think that Kevin Hart and Stone Cold is a good team up, but I think that uh, if you're looking at trying to create a buzz, create a stir, I think that Hulk Hogan and Dave Chappelle succeeds in that a little bit more because Spencer had a good point where he went against Dan and he said that, hey, well, this could make some people uncomfortable. And so I'm going to borrow Spencer's own argument against him from Eternals is that, yes, this Hulk Hogan, Dave Chappelle has a much lower ceiling. <laughs> no. Has a much lower floor. floor. Higher floor. Wait, I it's, don't it's remember. It's got a lower either. floor, but it's got a higher <laughs> ceiling. Gotcha. So All I right, think so, that, yeah. so you're going Dan. That's one for Dan. Danielle? Wow, this is interesting. I'm assuming that this, this Hulk Hogan and Dave Chappelle thing is a documentary, like it's comedians. a comedic duck, yeah, like a, a comedic, comedic duck. Yeah, kind of like coffee and cigarettes yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah something yeah. like that. Um, man, I I know exactly what kind of movie the Kevin Hart and Stone Cold Steve Austin movie is going to be. You hit everything it's going to be. It's going to be light. So he's going to get Stone Cold stunned. It's going to be a lot of laughing and not cringing. Um, this Dave Chappelle and uh, and Hulk Hogan movie, um, where they are just two people who probably hate each other visibly in a car together. That's uh, that is some buzzworthy stuff. So I'm going to go ah. with that one. All right, Dan, you get that point. It is four one game point. Also, a disaster, uh, but I. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, Kevin Hart, get well soon. I don't want to see him get stone cold stunned. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Um, all right, uh, question number two. It is game point for Dan. What summer 2019 movie would you fix by replacing the lead with Nicolas Cage? What summer 2019 movie? Would you Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Okay, God Godzilla. Or I'm Kyle replacing Chandler. Godzilla okay. with Nicolas Cage. Okay, and is it a, okay? We'll hear more. Replacing Godzilla with Nicolas Cage. I, I think we need to hear more. Um, yeah. Can I pick a Netflix film? Uh, judges. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, then I'm replacing, uh, I believe, Amy Poehler from Wine Country with <laughs> Nicolas Cage. Okay. Uh, we uh, have the uh, the Napa Valley th uh, romp, wine <laughs> country, and uh, Godzilla, King of the Monsters. We heard uh, Godzilla first. Uh, Dan, whenever you're ready. Cage, King of the Monsters. Who's not wanting to see Cage <laughs> fight King Ghidorah? Uh, oh my God, can you imagine? The one problem that Godzilla, King of the Monsters had was that by the end of it, you're like, oh, I've seen this. I would never get tired of Nicolas Cage meeting Rodan and the bombed out remnants of Boston with the atomic breath. Oh my God, it's everything I could possibly imagine in the summer movie and that movie would be 500 times more interesting. 
we kind of have seen Cage uh, play the monster, play larger than life, and we've seen old school Japanese uh, uh, Godzilla movies where it is just a guy in a suit fighting a giant lizard in a suit. It's not that cool. Whereas Wine Country, you need that wild card. This was such a dull movie with so many great comedic talents, and you needed someone to stir the pot and to kick things up a notch. This was not. Uh, this film was less than the sum of its parts, so you needed someone to to really. <laughs> Uh, Nicholas Cage will not be in a suit. He will be Nicholas Cage himself <laughs> fighting the monster. So it won't be man in suit. It will be Nicholas Cage fighting. And uh, a, a bad comedy with plus one good actor isn't going to save the whole comedy. Nicholas Cage single handedly replaced Godzilla. You're gonna get the, all the Godzilla fans coming after you hardcore like they came after us for making fun of their precious franchise. Nick Cage in Wine Country, you get Nick Cage plus alcohol, you get him eight bottles of Chablis deep, he's gonna murder <laughs> several Time. of those people. All right, which of these movies is gonna get a little more Bangkok dangerous? <laughs> uh, uh, Mark Ellis, take it away, brother. Yeah, uh, Dan really had me uh, from the word go with the whole Nicolas Cage replacing Godzilla. I was like, I am so locked into this movie, I cannot wait to see this. But then, listening to Spencer's argument, it kind of seemed like he's accurate in the fact that, like, I am a Godzilla fan, and I, if I go pay to go see Godzilla King of the Monsters, and Nick Cage has replaced Godzilla, I, I was going to the movie to see the giant lizard, not to see Nicolas Cage make a fool of himself. With Blind Country, I think that Nicolas Cage could actually add something to that that was missing. So I think making the movie better, Dan's would have been funny, would have been different, but I think that Spencer made his movie better. So I'm giving the vote to, to Spencer. Boom, one for Spenny. Lon. Uh, I gotta disagree with Mark on this one. I feel like you put Nicolas Cage in the middle of white country and it's just, it's an ensemble piece. He's just gonna suck up all the energy and all those other great comedians, they, they're not gonna get their chance to sort of play, whereas a huge, enormous, monster-sized Nicolas Cage just smashing the hell out of a city, I don't need another character, I don't need another scenario, I would watch that for two hours, I'm going with that. All right, Lon wants to leave some room for Anna Gasteyer, uh, Danielle Radford. <laughs> um, I, having recently seen both of these movies, um, so In I preparation I'm, I'm for today. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes things are handy. Um, so I, I have to agree that with, if you put Nicolas Cage in wine country, he does wind up taking over everything, whereas in Godzilla, his job is to take over everything. Plus, I would get to see Ice Cube's kid be like, oh, he got something going on with Mothra. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that I need that, so I have to go with Nicolas Cage replacing Godzilla. Boom, Dan, you just took movie fights! <laughs> Can I tell you what's been in my head since while you were judging? Yes. Is Kim Watson in an underground cavern <laughs> with Nicolas Cage curled up asleep <laughs> and him like putting his hand on Nicolas Cage's nostril and Nicolas oh, Cage opens good. his <laughs> eye and looks at him. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh. Friend. <laughs> Have any of you guys seen the um, the old uh, music group, The Monkees, their movie Head? Yes. yes. There was, yeah, there was a giant um, Victor Mature. He's yeah. an actor from like the 50s. Well and done pulling Victor yeah. Mature out there. Uh, I, I, I just, uh, yeah, I'm what, thinking of giant Nicolas Cage. What show Cage. did we see? Suddenly more nice. well, uh, my brothers. We thanks for, more victory thanks victory. for watching 60s drug flashbacks. Um, Dan, well <laughs> played you, in a weird, fun movie fight. Yeah. Um, Dan, I always I love to ask you this. Uh, who's taking this weekend's box office? Oh, it chapter two. Pennywise oh, yeah. is gonna gonna eat eat your children and all of the money. Oh hell yeah. <laughs> That's my children. Going to romp. Uh, any other uh, thoughts, shout outs? Uh, no, I hope uh, fun to do the show. I hope I know we're monthly now, but it's long and I hope you enjoyed it. We look forward to coming back uh, in about another month's time. I think we're thinking about a Joker uh, centered around Joker type fight Ooh, for when Joker, around the time so Joker twisted. comes out. Yeah. <laughs> Get ready, society. Oh, it's going to be twisted, but an homage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Spencer, uh, awesome stuff. Yeah. Uh, funny, knowledgeable. What, what, do you, what, do you, what do you got? What are you shouting out? Jerry Leto's Joker, man. Gone too soon. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we only had just begun. Yeah. Uh, uh, I got nothing. Right on. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mark, uh, you're, sir. you're the best. Uh, do you have any uh, stand updates coming up? <laughs> the scoreboard indicates otherwise, Hal, but thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be at the Comedy Store on Sunset right here in Los Angeles, September 12th, Thursday. Shows at 8 p.m. You can get tickets at MarkLSlive.com. Me, a bunch of funny people, surprise drop ins. Maybe somebody that is teaming up with a wrestler for an upcoming movie are going to pop in Whoa. to the Mark Ellis stand up show. Very Just cool. possibly. That's awesome. Please go see Mark Ellis and friends. Uh, Lon Harris. And Daniel Radford, two awesome people. Lon, what's going on? Tell them where they can find you and whatnot. Uh, just find me on Twitter at L O N S. 
That's it. Oh, hell yeah. That's all I got. Uh, Daniel Radford. Hi. Um, yeah, you yeah, find me at Danielle Radford on Twitter, Danielle underscore Radford on Instagram. Still trying to, to get those things so I can start getting my free fat lady clothes. Help me, help me. Um, <laughs> help this woman. Help me. Help me get in more dresses. Um, and then that's it. And if you like wrestling, I, I have a wrestling podcast called Tights and Fights. It comes out every Thursday. Heck yeah. Thank you, Danielle. Um, I got to shout out my pal Joe Starr. Thank you for kicking it off. Um, and uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, thank you, JTE. And thank you, Owl Nation. Hoot, hoot. I'm Hal Rudnick. Uh, hit me up on Twitter and Instagram, at Hal Rudnick. And uh, thank you for watching Movie Fights. Bye-bye.